Okay, got the red smoke. Gun run, north and south, west of the smoke, west of the smoke. Okay, copy, west of the smoke. I'm looking at danger close now. What do you want to talk about? Here's a question for you. You ready for this one? I'm ready. Have you done any more TV shows? Because <laughs> <laughs> it kind of explains how we met in the first place. But Do you ever really even talk about that show? I don't think I've heard you discuss it. I think you kind of pushed it out. I was hesitant to actually start like that because I, th- I thought it would actually drive people to maybe figure out what we're talking about. But no, I'm not, I'm not incredibly vocal about that experience. Neither am I. Yeah. That is how we met, though. Kind of. We actually didn't meet. We never physically we, met? No, you called me one day, and you're like, hey, what in the hell is going on? I'm like, okay, I'm glad that somebody else is catching this vibe, too. Yes, and then I think, like, every day or maybe 10 yeah. times a day, I'm like, Andy, what's going on? This is crazy. You know, I thought, obviously, I've thought a lot back about that experience. I think I would have been more okay with it had the expect- expectations been set differently. Because the way it was pitched to me was we're going to do a reality TV show, which should have been a fistful of red flags in my face. Just a fistful (laughs) of red flags that I completely ignored. And they just kept saying, hey, it's going to be be real. We're going to play it real time. And so I went into that, obviously, very naively. That was my first experience doing any type of TV and rapidly discovered that it was anything other than reality. Like when people say reality TV, what I think they mean is not reality. And it drove me nuts. It drove me batshit crazy. I remember that one day we were doing <laughs> I'm laughing because you and I had you on speed dial for everything. Oh, I call you up and I'd be like, what the? F-? You oh, can I swear. Can't. We're on the okay, internet. Okay, good. So I call you up all the time. Remember that one time I called you up for something? I don't remember what was going on. And you weren't answering. And then I text you. I'm like, where are you? You're like, I'm going home. Yeah, I was in my truck. I'm walking out like, here. What do you mean you're going home? <laughs> and you send me a snapshot of the highway. <laughs> you driving from LA to San Diego. I'm like, what are you doing? We're we're filming. No, um, I'm not filming anymore. I was I was done at that point. So we we should probably actually tell people what we're talking about. So it was a CBS show called Hunted. Yes. In the <laughs> reality TV show category, and like all I can say is it was a. Uh, that was, it was special. It was special. Was that, your fir- that wasn't your first experience with TV, though, was it? I've done news. I've, I've, I've seen you on the news quite a bit, actually, the since news. then. I did the news quite a bit, covering uh, national security, covering law enforcement, crime. That was my first TV show, and it was pitched to me a certain way as it was pitched yeah. to you. And, but I had never met you. We talked for months well, we talked during that time yeah. with, um, when we were filming. Well, you were in Atlanta, right? I was in Atlanta. You were in L.A. And the first time I met you was when we went skydiving, mm-hmm. which was my, my first time skydiving. Yeah. It was mine, too. No. It was, it was not. not. It was awesome. <laughs> it was awesome. That's right. I forgot I took you for a tandem. Yes. Because yeah. I was like, Andy, I've never jumped out of a plane. And I was like, well, if I'm going to jump out of a plane, it's going to be with a former SEAL. So there you go. Not all former SEALs are good at jumping. You should know that. Okay, I knew you. Yes, I took it uh, a little bit further than most guys did because I loved it. So I went and pursued additional qualifications. Your average military jumper probably has about 100 jumps after a decade. That's low. You don't want to strap yourself to that person. So use with caution. Somebody listening to this, don't just go try to find some ex and be like, hey, let's do a tandem. It may not work out well. Well, you're the only person I ever jumped with. Well, there you go. You're going to be safe. I always <laughs> tell people, we're all going to die, but you're not going to die jumping with me. So you might get hurt, but we're probably not going to die. How did you transition, though, from jumping to base jumping? Um, I always wanted to ask you that because it just seems such a, a, a different... They're similar in a lot of ways. Like you're using a parachute. Um, well, you're at some point falling through the air. The body positions are the same. The biggest difference is, so you remember when we did our jump, a tandem jump, did you ever get that sensation that you were falling like the stomach rising? It's, or a lot of people equate it with going over the top of a roller coaster ride. You get mm-hmm. that stomach rise sensation. Mm-hmm. Did you get that when we went out of the airplane? I don't remember. I would say you probably didn't. If I had asked you the day that we jumped, most people will say that they didn't because the aircraft is already moving. It's probably going close to 100 miles an hour. So when you jump out, you already have that forward speed. Mm -hmm. You continue to accelerate, but you're not going from 
zero miles an hour to 100. So there's no sensation of falling when you skydive. When you step off of a static object, the opposite is true. Like you get that rise in your stomach because you're going from nothing and you feel that acceleration. So that's certainly different. Um, it was something that I was curious about. I wasn't able to do it while I was in the military. It was actually expressly prohibited. Not that that stopped everybody, but I wanted to wait until I got out. And I did it by researching on the internet. I just started Googling who has the most base jumps in the world. I was just trying to find like the number one person who had survived in that world for the longest and was still thriving. And the name that I kept getting from people that I knew in the skydiving world was Miles Dasher, who he is awesome. Good friend of mine. He lives in uh, Twin Falls, Idaho. And I went to the drop zone and found somebody who had known him for decades before that, got an email address, sent him a blind email. He responded and I said, hey, let's do this and send him a check and met him at the bridge in Idaho completely blind and he started teaching me and then he really kind of mentored me through for the next two or three years all the way out to uh he taught me how to fly a wingsuit because first you have to base jump you have to you, you need to learn how to skydive first and then if you want to base jump you need to learn how to base jump they're similar but different then if you want to put a wingsuit on and wingsuit base jump you need to learn how to do that skydiving so actually how to fly the suit and then you add that into the base jumping world and i did my first wingsuit base jump in italy it, off Monte Brento. So we did a month long trip, started in Italy and then into the Lauterbrunnen Valley in Switzerland. And he showed me all over that place, but it took a long time. But I would think it's different because when you jump out of a plane in the beginning, you're doing tandem jumps so you can get used to it. You don't have to do a tandem jump. That's actually a choice. You can go and you can jump out on your own. You're being held onto on both sides though. So you, you have your own parachute and you're responsible for flying it after it opens, but you have people holding onto you on each side. But when you base jump, you are on your own, <laughs> which is why you need to come into that with some experience in the skydiving world. Like the, probably the biggest thing is learning how to control the canopy, how to fly it. Because in base jumping, like at Skydive San Diego, where we did our tandem, there's a huge grass area, yeah. you know, where you can land anywhere you want to. Base jumping, some areas are maybe the size of a tennis court and you have to be able to, maybe it's surrounded by trees or boulders because you're jumping off of something and they're not thinking about the construction phase of that where should we put a landing zone? So you're kind of forcing an activity onto something that's pre-existing. That's insane. That's awesome. And I don't look at it as insane. I look at it as a calculated risk, <laughs> <laughs> which I actually have drastically backed off of in the last few years. Uh, I don't know if I'll ever base jump again, actually. Uh, skydiving is a different story. It's much safer because you're higher, you have a reserve parachute, uh, all that stuff. And I've, I mean, I've been skydiving for over 20 years now, so it's I literally do it sometimes with my eyes closed. I'll just sit there. And I think you took a nap when I was up there with you. I was quiet on, at one point. I, I fall asleep you. I'm on like, a, you awake? I fall asleep on the planes all the time. <laughs> it's one of the fastest ways to get me to go to sleep is to put me into an airplane that's taxiing on the ground or flying. I was like nudging. I'm like, Andy, look, the Mexican border over there. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great drop zone. You can see the San Diego Bay. You can see all the downtown San Diego. You can see Tijuana, the hills out east of San Diego. It's a cool place. It's amazing. Yeah, it's like it was... 10 minutes from my old house. So I'd drink a cup of coffee in the morning, drop the kids off at school, sit in the backyard. I would hear the plane take off and just go out there and jump all day long, every day. It was awesome. It's really cool. It was cool. I don't have the chance to do that here in Montana anymore, but, you know, if you look at the mountains, snow's coming down, so I'll just go snowboarding. Oh, I saw the, the plane was landing yesterday. <laughs> yeah. Um, have you ever been to Montana? I've been, I may have been when I was with the president during one of his campaigns, probably Obama. I don't remember because sometimes we would do... Obama did come to the Whitefish Mountain Resort. I have seen pictures of Blackhawks landing up there, and I have to assume that was part of his advance or how he got there. It's possible because sometimes, especially during a campaign year, like the 2012 campaign year, we do five states in two days. Yeah. And so there are times where I wouldn't know what state we were, we were in. Um, we'd land and... And that moment I knew, but then you just get back up on the plane. It's like, all right, now we're going to Texas. Now we're going here. Now we're going there. So it was a whirlwind. But I did drive from, was it last summer or the summer before? I drove from New York City to Vancouver, and I, pat I drove through Montana. I did that. That I remember. Why did you choose to do that? That is not a short drive. That was my husband. He wanted to <laughs> do it. <laughs> That's fair. He's like, I want to see. Hey, you want to see the U.S.? I want to see the U.S. 
Which is fine, but the first half of the trip, it's all highway. I was just going to say... You don't see the U.S. When you go east of the Rockies... You don't see it. You see gas stations. It's and flat. You see, you, you see maybe sometimes cornfields or whatnot. Yeah. That was the only letdown, that first part of it, that first half. You really don't see the U.S. I think after you hit that midway point, then you start seeing really the country. And it was nice. I will never do it again. But How it long did great. it take you? I think five days. That sounds about right. Five days. It was a lot. We drove a lot. I the went. last few days of that are going to be the best. As soon as you start hitting the topography of the Rockies and the Western states. Yes. Now, then you're happy. Yes. We went through, I think, Wyoming, Montana, Seattle, and then up to Vancouver. That part was nice. Awesome. Yeah. Yes. I won't be doing it again, though. It's yep. a lot to sit in that car. Have you ever done a cross country? Multiple times when we really? moved. Yeah. We moved from San Diego to Virginia Beach and then Virginia Beach back and drove... Uh, both of those times with U-Hauls. But I feel like you were going with a purpose. You're going to move. He wanted to do it as a vacation, my husband. Did you guys drive back from Vancouver? No, we flew. <laughs> 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 that was not happening. It's like, all right, let's up on the plane. Let's yes. Go. No, no, negative. No, no. You made the right call. Yes. I would even, if I had taken my personal vehicle, consider flying back and figuring out a different way to get the car back as opposed to doing that drive in both directions. I mean, and I don't think the purpose makes a difference. It was a long drive once you got past. We would do the southern route. Once you got past Denver, it's flat. Wouldn't the military move your, your stuff for you? They can, and we've taken advantage of that, but you still have to drive your personal vehicles. I'm trying to remember how they did it in the service. I want to say that they... It's probably similar. You might be right. I'm trying to remember, because, I mean, I only really went from New York City to Washington, D.C., because I, sta- I first started in New York... Then I went to Washington, D.C. because we have different phases in our Mm -hmm. career. The first phase is you start off as an investigator. A lot of people don't know what we do investigations. Before you get into that, we should start back at the beginning. (laughs) Okay. Because we, oh yeah, opened up on talking about a TV show that don't go watch people, please. (laughs) But it is how we met, so that's awesome. It is, it is, it's true. I will let you introduce yourself because I will mess it up. Okay, um... So let's see. I'm Evie, Mm -hmm. and I am from New York, New York City. I was born and raised there. I started in the NYPD very briefly when I graduated college, and then... What would you get your degree in? I studied political science, and I actually studied fine art, too. I loved art, drawing, painting, and then my mother's like... You know, my mother... My parents are immigrants. They came from Greece, my Your mother, last name is one of the most Greek <laughs> last names ever. Evi, it's Evi Pumburas, but in uh, English or American, it's Pomporis or Paparis <laughs> or Pompadupis <laughs> or whatever people want to call me, which is fine. I never take offense. It's a multi-syllable last name. I just have you on my phone as EVP. <laughs> so when I, I love the art, and my, my, I remember my mother, she's like, you can't live on that. How are you going to make money? So I studied government, studied political science, and... I worked for a congresswoman for about two years, but as an intern, and it was great. And then, honestly, I was trying to figure my way around everything. I've graduated school, and I didn't know what I was going to do. And I, I had an, a job in a, an office doing underwriting, accounting. Loan I, underwriting? I don't even know. It was for uh, AIG, okay. AIG, an insurance group. And I remember sitting at my desk thinking, this, this is it? Like, is this, is this what I went to school for? And I only did it for a couple of months. And as I remember one day, I'm... I'm on the New York City subway going from Queens to the World Trade Center. The World Trade Center, that's where our office was near there at the time. And I'm sitting back and I'm really stressed out. And I see the subway doors open and I see this New York City police officer hanging out. He's just sitting there and he was, it was back in the day when it was a little different. He's got his beer belly hanging out. He's in his uniform leaning back. Are you sure it's that different? <laughs> They're a little, it's different now. <laughs> No that. disrespect to any of them, but I see <laughs> often people in the first responder world who are going to need a first responder if something happens. Well, that's because you go through training, you, you get in great shape, but then after that, there's no, there's no standard, there's no testing. There's nobody coming in saying, hey, you have to maintain this. It's a one-time standard, then you're through the test gate? Uh, correct. At least that's how it was in the NYPD. I don't know if it's changed since then. When I went to my latter agency, the U.S. Secret Service, that was different. We had standards we had to keep. But I remember the subway doors opening and seeing this police officer thinking, I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is, so most people grow up thinking, this is what I want to do when I grow up. Yes, I'm not that person. 
So that night I go home and I call 212 Recruit because there was no internet back then, none of that stuff. And this yeah, what guy, year is this? Two, 1999 or 2000. There was the internet. Not it just for, wasn't what it is it today. It wasn't what it is today. Yeah. So I found out what the number was. So it was 212 Recruit, I remember. I call up and this guy picks up. He's like, yellow, recruit. Recruitment. <laughs> 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 So I'm like, uh, hello, sir. He's like, yeah, what do you want? I was like, well, I, I want to, I didn't know what to say. I was like, I want to be a police officer. He's like, you do, huh? And I was like, well, what do I, I need to do? He's like, well, you're lucky. He's like, we got a test coming up. And he's like, all right. And I was like, what is he? He's like, next week. He gave me the address. He's like, here you go is the address. He's like, what's your name? <laughs> so I start spelling. He's like, what kind of name is that? He's like, never mind, don't tell me. So I was like, what do I do? He's like, just take the test. He's like, good luck, kid. Click. It was like literally a two-minute call. And I just show up to this high school on a weekend, I think it was. And I go in and you take a, a written exam. I don't remember what the exam was called. I should. And you take the exam and then you see if you pass. If you pass or based on your score, you get called in. And so I passed the exam. I, I ended up doing really well, which surprised me because, you know, those standardized tests, standardized tests like SATs, all that mm -hmm. stuff, I was horrible at that stuff. And then they just call you, it's like, come on in. And then there's a series of things that they make you do, some physical stuff, um, some medical stuff to see if you can withstand certain things. I remember them running like a, an electric current through my body just to see like... Really? Yeah, I, I forgot what it was called. It was something with a, almost I think like the way you do heart for the EKG? EKGs. It might have been that. But I remember them, it was kind of connected in different parts of my body and they wanted just to see if I was healthy enough. Oh, I wonder if they were giving you like a stress test of some kind. I think that I think that's what it might have been. I was so truly, I was so clueless, uh, you know. And I'm thinking, oh, at New York City Police Academy, it'll be like college. Did you have any idea what you were getting into? Zero, zero, zero. Clueless, clueless. I liked, I did like the idea of helping people. Yeah. I always kind of we grew up in we grew up. I don't want to say poverty. We weren't we weren't very poor, but we grew up poor. I lived in low income housing as my parents were immigrants when they came to the United States. And so we were victims of crime quite a bit. And so I always grew up with this kind of thing, feeling that I had to know how to protect myself. I always wanted to protect my family. So I think I didn't realize I was going through this path, maybe subconsciously, but it just kind of happened. And so you go through the testing, and then there was this one test where in the NYPD, there's a 12-pound trigger pull is what they call it. So not all police departments have it, mm -hmm. that when you pull the trigger of your handgun, it's 12 pounds, and it can be very taxing on your hand. Why would it be set to 12 pounds? So it's set to 12 pounds so that you can't pull it quickly because there have been incidents in the past historically, and I want to say it goes back to, and I could be mistaken, Amadou Diallo shooting where they had shot him. I believe it was around four police officers shot him 41 times. Yeah. And people were kind of looking at this, how, these horrible police officers. How can you do that? And what you don't realize is that when you're in a stressful situation, sometimes you don't realize in your moment of panic like how many times... You're actually pulling that trigger. And so my understanding was they instilled this 12-pound trigger pull. That way you are having to work each time you pull that trigger. And let me tell you, mm. when you're on the range practicing, it was it, 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 your hands would get really, really tired. You know, I don't know what the triggers, I know what the triggers were set for on the rifles, and it was substantially lower than that. That's interesting. I mean, there's another approach to that is just to give your people better training. Because that did happen in my old job, too. I mean, you would have people who, I mean, you know, there's ADs and NDs, accidental discharges and negligent discharges. And I suppose having a, a higher trigger pull could reduce some of those. But I think the key to that is just more training and practice. Because a 12-pound trigger pull on a pistol is ridiculous. It is. It's, it was every <laughs> single every single pull. Or and it's probably likely to decrease your accuracy. Well, one of the tests, what they do is they took, they give me, I remember they gave me a gun. I never held a gun before. And it was a, a Smith & Wesson. And there was a metallic triangle, not very big, mm -hmm. maybe about this size. And they put my hand through it and he, with one hand and he, the instructor was, pull the trigger. And I had to pull it without tapping the triangle. In oh, the interesting. Minute, the minute you tap the triangle, the minute you hear that ding, um, you fail. And the first time I did it, I failed. Because I had oh, they're it. checking probably for fatigue and just the hand, hand, hand strength, hand, strength, hand yeah. fatigue, and I didn't have it at that time. And luckily for me, I guess they didn't have enough people. They called me back. They're like, hey, come back again. We'll let you do it again. What a bizarre test. Put your hand in that metal triangle, and we're going to see if you contact the edge yes. while you pull the trigger. Absolutely. I've never heard of that. Yeah. I wonder where they got that from. I don't know. 
I don't know. I mean, I, I thought, I understand why they did it, but I, I think for someone like me who hadn't done any of that stuff, I mean, I knew later on to build strength in my hands. Yeah. Um, but I guess I can understand them wanting to make sure you have the physical strength to do it and that you're capable of doing it. I suppose. So how was the rest of the academy? Well, you're not even into it yet. You're still... So <laughs> <laughs> I passed everything. There's multiple tests. I passed all the different phases. And then they call, they, I remember working my job and they call me up and they're like, hey, you passed everything. Do you want the job? I was like, yes, I'd love it. All right. They're like, you start in two... It was Friday. They're like, you start Monday. And I was like, wait, I... Oof. I have to give my boss two weeks, two weeks notice. I was like, they're like, yeah, well, you know, this is how we work. I'm like, you don't do the whole two weeks notice thing. They're like, nope, you want it. You got to be here on Monday. So we'll, either see, we'll, you know, either see you or you don't. We don't. And I showed up that Monday. I went in. Of course, the place where I quit AIG was furious with me because I didn't give him proper notice. But I worked that weekend. I remember trying to tie up whatever accounts I had. I show up on that Monday. Andy, I had zero clue as to what I was walking into. It's paramilitary, which I had no <laughs> knowledge. And I roll in there. I'm like, oh, this will be like college. It's going to be great. And I walk in. And Did it's you just say this is going to be like college? <laughs> yes. Oh, my yes. God, Evie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm putting it all out there. The truth. Zero clue. I didn't grow up in a military family. I didn't grow up. And mind you, my parents don't know any of this. Because they, they were afterward, after I got in, and I told them I'm going to be to the New York City Police Academy. They were so upset with me. So why? upset. They couldn't, I don't think they could understand why I wanted to do it. And I think we came, look, my parents grew up in a village and they were poor. They never went to college. They, these were things that were really outside the norm. You didn't do these type of things. And they were kind of like, you're a girl. Girls don't do these things. And I remember going through the academy and it was hard for me because I, I went in not understanding what I was walking into. Best experience of my life, by the way. And I remember my mom and my dad, they wouldn't speak to me. They were so upset because at the time I lived at home. But, you know, f going back to the first day at the academy, I roll in there and they have us, they start teaching us front-leaning rests and standing at attention. Front-leaning rests is a push-up <laughs> for people listening. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know any of this stuff other than what I see on TV. And I'm thinking, why is he teaching us this? And little did I know that this is part, Those of, are the the, tools. part of the process. And it was that first week, the training, everything. So just to give you an idea, there were 1,500 recruits. On that Monday? In the academy, yes. 1,500. And you were just a body. And they wanted people to drop out because they just bring all these people in and they just push you and stress you out and test you and yell at you and all that stuff. And I'm, because they want people to drop out. I mean, it really was... Well, they probably didn't have 1,500 job openings. They did not. I think the graduating class was, you know, I don't know what the graduating class was. I shouldn't say, but I do remember the first month, 300 people quit. They just got up and left because they really pushed you. And uh, truth be told, I was almost that person. That first week, I was so upset. Why is everybody yelling at me? I'm such a good person. <laughs> Why are they calling me all these names? <laughs> I didn't realize that this is just how it's structured. That's the system. But I had zero. I'm a girl from Queens. I have no idea what I'm walking into. And PT was a nightmare. We had this gym, this huge gym, and there was this green line. And anybody who's been through the academy, the old academy, now they have a new one, there was a green line around the gym. And it was like the green line of death. They would line us up four in a row, set us up in ranks, and the gym could only fit maybe a few hundred people at a time. So you had to run in ranks at arm's length, arm in front, arm in back. And if you couldn't keep up, I mean, they pull you out. And when they pull you out, it wouldn't be like, oh, why don't you take a, you know, rest here. They put you in the middle. And they'd have you do suicides up and down, back and forth. And you just see people. It was the first time I saw people throw up from working out. <laughs> this was new to me. I'm like, why are we vomiting? And it was brutal. And I remember, I ne and I never ran before. I, I never had to run. I'm thinking, oh, I'm skinny. I look like I'm in shape. No, not the same thing. So I, the first week when I went running, I ran around that circle and I could not keep up. Of course, I didn't want to fall out. So the instructor just grabs me, yanks me out, puts me in the middle and I'm doing suicides. And then after that, after everybody's done running, they put you in the middle and they make everybody about face to the people in the middle. So you were called a fallout. So I was a fallout. And I remember the instructor being like, you see these people here? You go tell these people, you tell them to quit because they're going to get you killed. Because when you call for... For help, when you call at 1013, I believe it's 1013, officer needs assistance, you're going to die because they can't come save you. I like this instructor. 
they were all like that, just so you know. And I was mortified, mortified. And I remember it was the, one of the worst feelings I ever had. I went down to my locker room, and I was like, I will never fall out again. And I started running every morning and every night. You know, I'd run if we were day shift, because our shifts would go from day to night. So if I was day shift, I'd run at, during the day at the academy, then run at night. Mm. And then, you know, the flip side, if it was night shift, and I would pray. I would be at my locker praying, please don't let me fall out. Please don't let me fall out. And I had a good company. Our, our class, my class was a 0039. My company was great. I good, had a lot of former military people. Mm. And they were just fantastic. They're like, hey, you got this. And we, I, it was just after that, I loved it. It was great. It was terrifying. Was it a live-in academy, or did you guys no. go home at the end of the they, day? They didn't have fifteen hundred beds. Yeah, I was thinking about that. I, well, I don't know about New York if they do it like off-site in like upstate and then bring you back. No, my academy was actually at the time attached to the one three precinct in the city. So I want to say that was like on Nineteenth Street downtown, and it was just the 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 building was old. It was decrepit. The staircases were falling in. Now they built a new academy in College Point, Queens. It's much bigger, um, but it was. It was, it was the best. It was, I hated it. Mm -hmm. I was upset. I remember. And I, d I did not understand what I was walking into, but I'm glad I stuck it out. So I really went in completely naive, completely clueless. Like probably if you think of that movie clueless, I was her to some level. <laughs> <laughs> I was her and it, it just shifted. And then it wasn't, it was while I was in there, I had already applied to other agencies like DEA, FBI. When did you Secret make Service. those applications? I did those maybe before or after you saw the subway cop around that time, I think. And I had bought a, a, a book. It was, it was about international careers because I spoke different languages and I loved the world. I loved traveling. I studied overseas when I was in college and I had lived in Italy. So I learned Italian. Then I lived in Spain and Mexico and I learned Mac um, Spanish and then France. And so I had this love for the world, but in this book called international careers, they had, it was, it was a book. They had about 300 organizations. It was companies, government, anybody you could think of, that had, to, had offices overseas. And so when I f did my resumes, I, I did 300 applications. I did 300 resumes. 300? I sent 300 resumes out. I was like, somebody's going to give me a job. Somebody. Because I really, my parents couldn't help me. I did not know where to start. Yeah. So I happened to send a, a, um, a resume to the Secret Service. Did you have any idea what they did? I knew they protected the president. That was it. They were the guys in the dark suits. <laughs> this is, you know, I'm going to be honest. I, yeah. I, I don't want to be that person that's like, yeah, I grew up. This is what I wanted to do. I was not her. And I really kind of figured it, all, uh, figured it out along the way. But once I got in, I was like, I'm doing this. I'm committed. And it changed me. It changed my life. And so I, I had happened to send out all those resumes. And one day in the mail, I get this government form and it, a small letter from the Secret Service saying, hey, if you're interested in applying, fill in these forms. And over a period of time, I was doing that. And then at, this, at the same time, I was in the academy. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, what does it hurt? And then I would just get called in for different phases of the hiring process, which is a test that you have to take another written exam, which was brutal. It was called the TEA exam, TEA. And I think they've changed it since. I thought for sure I failed it. There was no way. Is that like a general aptitude test, basically? Yes, but it was... For me, it was like the SAT on steroids. And I heard that I heard, they, I heard they had to change it because so many people had a hard time passing it. In fact, I barely passed mine. I remember when they called me to say, hey, you passed your test. I was like, hold on, let me spell my last name for you again because <laughs> you might have me mixed up with well, someone else. Well, was that else. rough? I, for me, it was rough. And from what I know from my other colleagues, everybody was like, that was a rough test. It was, it was really, it felt like an SAT exam. And I'm thinking, I'm like, what are we going to be doing? Algebra? Like, I don't understand this. Um, and so it was one of the ways they would filter people. So when I passed it, there was other phases, a medical exam. They need to make sure you're medically fit. And then there was a polygraph, which nobody loves. Those are fun. We can talk about that later because <laughs> I know you're a polygraph in... administer. I know. For the person who hated her polygraph, <laughs> I ended up becoming one. And so I went through that process. And then finally, one day I get a phone call saying, hey, you've, you've passed through the hiring process. We'd like to give you a conditional offer of employment, which means you're not hired. You're going to go through training, and there's two phases of training. And if you pass the phases of training, then we offer you a job. And at this point, I'm in the police academy. It's been a few months in. Now I love it. I finally figured it out. I got it. I'm good. How long is the police academy? At the time when I went, it was eight months. Okay. So um, maybe it was right before what we, they call gun and shield day. Gun and shield day is when you take the police recruits and you actually put them on the street 
to work with police precincts so they can see what it's like. Hmm. So it's like sort of midway in the academy, they take you out and they put you on the street. The crappy thing is, I don't know if they still do it, at the time you're, when you're a cadet, you're wearing a gray shirt. And everybody in New York knows that if you're wearing a gray shirt, you yeah, recruit. You're, you're the rookie. Yes, and they put us on the street with a gray shirt. <laughs> everybody would get their asses kicked. I even, initially I used to take the subway to go to the academy, then I stopped. Because this was all pre-9-11, and people yeah. really disliked law enforcement. And I would, people would look at me on the subway, and I, I, when I remember one guy shoved me once, and I was like, you know what, I'm just going to start driving in. And I started driving in with some other recruits, and we would park the car. Yeah. Just because I didn't want to be out with my uniform, because people knew I was a recruit. I suspect that mentality has shifted completely on its head post-9-11. It did post-9-11, but now I think we're back. I think today we might be back there a little bit. I've had great experiences with police in New York. I go infrequently. And actually, I'm always, I always go to the 9-11 memorial, and that's about it. And I also stay out of trouble. And I just know sir, yes, ma'am type stuff as well. It's right. amazing the response <laughs> you get from law enforcement when you treat them like that. Yes, I know. It's not typical to get that. I think when you hear someone speak to you that way, you know automatically this person's either military or law enforcement or has somebody in law enforcement or, or sociopath military. Or a sociopath. Possibly, possibly, <laughs> possibly. Yeah. How many women were in the academy? In the NYPD, I have to say there were, there were some women. Um, in, so I went from academy class of 1,500 to the service where it was 54. And I think we were, we were four women. And in your rest, Secret Service Academy, Secret there was 54? 54. How big was that class? So you eventually did make the shift. You decided that... I did. I did switch over. I almost did. And I remember I went to the lieutenant at the NYPD because I was like, do I want to leave? And I remember one of my instructors, I went to him. I forgot his name. He was the funniest guy. He was my behavioral science instructor. And I was like, sir, I don't know what to do. Secret Service offered me this. There's no guarantee. And he's like, what do you want to go there for? He's like, you only got to do 20 years for with us. If you go there, you got to do a full 25. He's like, they're going to make you work there. <laughs> he's like, stay here. And so I went to one of the higher ups and I, I, I laid it out. I was like, sir, I don't know what to do. And I didn't know this lieutenant and he's like, sit down, recruit. And I remember him saying, he's like, look, we'll, we'll always take you back. He's like, do this. He's like, this is a, an extraordinary opportunity. Just do it. He's mm -hmm. like, if you don't like it, just come back. And I really appreciated that. I don't remember his name or anything. And so I ended up doing the shift, and I ended up going into training. And so the first part of training is in the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. We call it FLETC. It's yep. in Georgia. So you go through that part, and that's really like the federal government. Most Isn't that the origin for DA agents? Everybody. Yeah, everybody. They go there because that sets that baseline of understanding for the federal government. Yes. So if you want to be a federal agent for the U.S. government, this is where you go. And they teach you the standard for the federal government as far as how to, the laws, how mm -hmm. to enact arrests, um, the driving, all that stuff. They, so there's like, it's kind of almost getting, fulfilling, fulfilling that standard. I think everybody except the FBI goes there. FBI has their own. Quantico. Quantico. They do their own thing there. Um, so if you pass that first part of training, you graduate, then you go to the Secret Service training, which is in Beltsville, Maryland. And that is now specific to the U.S. Secret Service. And you, you know, how long is Fletzy? Fletzy's three months, and then Beltsville was three months. Okay. And so then you do when you go to Secret Service training. Now it's specific to protection to the cases they work, which a lot of people don't know. It, they, it's a dual mission agency, so it's protection, mm -hmm. and then it's also investigative. And that's what it was founded on, right? Was investigation. So it was created on April fourteenth, eighteen sixty-five. Abraham Lincoln signed created the U.S. Secret Service. It was the day, and it was the same day he was assassinated, ironically. Was it really? He was assassinated on that same day, the day he created it, created it. but it was created for counterfeit currency because at the time, a third of U.S. Cur uh, currency in the U.S. was counterfeit. And we were, it was having, a, it was affecting the economy. So Abraham Lincoln created them for that. It wasn't until 1901, after we had multiple presidents assassinated, where they looked over to the Secret Service and said, hey, why don't you also do protection, protect the president? Yeah. So it's one of the older agencies. I think federal mar the marshals were created before us, and then we were created. And then after, they, when they created the FBI, they actually took Secret Service agents out and then created the, the FBI. Interesting. I've always found it ironic to create an organization called the Secret Service, but then be public with their creation. <laughs> I think it's the name. <laughs> I think it's the name. It draws, like, so much attention. 
It's like, what's going on over there? You, don't worry about it. That's the Secret Service. Oh, really? Tell me more. That's you have to admit it's a pretty legit name. <laughs> it's awesome. It's a bullshit awesome name. It is. It it's is. way better than like being a SEAL. People are like, what's that? I'm like, I don't know. It's a stupid acronym. Leave me alone. Although I feel like like the whole world knows what it is. What yeah, for the wrong is. reasons. For the wrong reasons. I don't. I mean, we used to work with SEALs, and I remember when I do protection assignments, there were there would always be members of the SEALs, or there'd be a liaison with the mm-hmm. SEALs, like when we work shifts. And I was the one person who would just. I was so always so curious, so I'd sit out there, I'm like, "Hey, <laughs> what was training like?" The natural interrogator, huh? Hey, I read this book. I remember uh, one guy? I think I wore him out. And I was like, "Oh, I read this one book." He's like, "Yeah, don't even, don't read everything you read." And I was really fascinated. I was like, well, what's your training like? Because I was very curious to see the, the difference. Yeah. I actually hosted the uh, CAT team for a mm-hmm. week in, uh, when I was at development group on the East Coast. They came down and used the kill house for a week, and I was their liaison and just chatted with those guys. The stories of which I will share after we turn the recording devices <laughs> uh, off because I'm pretty sure they wouldn't want me to share them. But I ended up, uh, one of the guys was super cool. I took my family up to the White House and got one of the tours at Christmas time. It was really cool. But yeah, I, I actually didn't realize that it was created for the, the counterfeiting until I was reading through the beginning of your book. I know, yeah. It's, it's well, for Kat, for your listeners, it's, the, it's our version of the ca- uh, SWAT. Yep, the, the counter service, assault the counter, team. Counter assault team. And they train really intensely as well. Like they're pretty... They're hardcore too. Yeah. They, I mean, they basically showed up wearing the same stuff that we would show up on target wearing with a uh, much more restrictive set of rules of engagement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's different. Well, because when you're in military, you're operating overseas. Yeah. You know, and, and, and we're not having to worry about, you know, the constitution and yeah. civil rights and we don't have to announce ourselves. I mean, I've worked with uh, quite a few SWAT teams and just local police departments some of the things that they have to do in a tactical environment, they just, they bring the hair up on the back of my neck, you know, having, announcing, yelling their presence before they make entry, like, hey, I'm about to come in this room. You know, they're obviously <laughs> not saying that, but when they're yelling police department before making entry into a room, it's just like, Whoa. Well, because it gives, it gives it away. It gives away that you're coming in. It's, it does, it, but they are the also... a whole element of surprise. Yeah, but they're worried about getting sued and losing, you know, no. doing the correct thing on target, but then losing in a courtroom. That's a tough... That's a tough environment to operate in. Well, people don't realize it, it is difficult law enforcement. I had, I had insurance. What? Oh, we, had, we all had insurance. We had, um, I was called uh, Wright and Company as a company. I had law enforcement insurance because it was understood at some point in your career, you're going to get sued. When you were a federal agent, you yes. had this? Yes. There's a, it, was an, it was a loan. My husband still has it because he's in federal government. I'm like, no, you have to keep, you have to keep this. And, it's, and it's, it's an insurance policy. So that way, if I'm sued, I have legal representation if mm-hmm. I need it. And if they sue, they sue my insurance policy. They don't sue me. The it government a, doesn't provide that for the federal agents? They could, but there are situations. If, if the government, for some reason, says, you know what? That shooting incident you were in, we're like, mm, we don't think, we don't like it. Or if there's enough pressure from you know, the media or from outside, mm-hmm. they might, you might be left out there on your own to figure it out. Wow. Because there are times where they may not support you or there's a civil lawsuit. So I had, I had insurance. I paid for it every year, religiously. So a lot of people don't realize it. It's like, it's like being I a doctor. I had no idea, yeah. It's like being a doctor. You have a lot of doctors have liability insurance. Or malpractice insurance. I had the same thing as a federal agent. Did and you it, know anybody who had to use it? I don't know if they use it, but there were these... There was these agents that I know of that were involved in the lawsuit. They went in, and I'm, I don't remember the whole story, so I may not say it correctly, but they went into a home to do an arrest. And when they went into the home, I believe the person at, at the residence uh, was going for a weapon. They took out their firearms. They shot the person. Mm-hmm. Um, the person went down. As soon as the person went down, they immediately went and gave him first aid, medical aid, and then took him to the hospital and although criminally, there was no criminal charges, they were correct, what happens is the, the person they shot took a the, civil, you know, lawsuit. civil lawsuit, which you only need preponderance of the evidence to get that. And they were involved in this lawsuit for years, years. And I remember one of them, he had, he had been in the New York field office with me, both of them had been, and then we ended up being on the president's detail together. And I remember one day, and it kind of broke my heart, he looked over at me and he said, you know, if I knew then what I know now, he's like, maybe I would have been a little bit slower 
taking my gun out of my holster. He's like, it wasn't worth all this that I've been through. That's a very dangerous headspace to get into. I think because he had just been through so much and they had been dragged through the mud and I think their names were in the papers and they, it was a legit, it was, yeah. it was a legit shoot, but it was just the, the ordeal of it. And what I mean by that is it's dangerous to have people thinking that in the back of their mind. That's the last thought that you want to have in that environment. I think, I think a lot of law enforcement, I think today maybe feel that way. How could they not? I mean, it's definitely trial by popular opinion before it ever is going to go to a trial by a jury. And, uh, I mean, you work in the news, a celebrity, if you will. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not. I've actually kind of laid off the news a bit. But I bet you they reach out anytime there's a high-profile incident and they want to get your opinion on it. And in my experience, people ask me for my opinion on it all the time, too. And I always say the same thing. I don't know. I wasn't there. And I'm not gonna, I am not going to cast judgment on somebody in a tactical situation that most people would never understand. Because there's a process for the investigation to conduct itself. And they're going to get tried by a jury of their peers. And if they're found guilty, then maybe we can talk about it. And if they're found innocent, we can talk about it at the same time. But until then, I have nothing to offer. Because I understand the complexity of making decisions in those environments. It is so complex. And I think when you see a snapshot picture of what happens, and I'm not saying there are some situations where you're thinking, that is sure. bad. That yeah. is a bad sh- situation there. That's a bad shoot. But then there's some situations where I can understand it. Or yeah. like I can see that maybe I could have made that choice or been involved in that. And it's very difficult to show somebody a snapshot of this happened. Oh my gosh, this person was unarmed. But the thing is, you don't know they're unarmed until after it's, it's over sometimes. You and don't unarmed know. does not mean not a threat or not dangerous. Correct. I mean, it's, uh, we operated under the same, we had a very, actually I would say pretty strict ROE overseas and you had to have either hostile intent or hostile act or the combination of the two. And nowhere in there does it say that they have to have a weapon. Well, I remember, because I struggled with this, because I'm not a big person, and I remember when we did rules of engagement and tactical training, I, always, I was very, I asked my instructors, I was like, can I shoot someone who is bigger than me? Can I, if I, had, and you know, what are, do I have different parameters? Evie, you would have to shoot everybody. <laughs> that is not, I am stealth mode, do not listen to this, man. We're going to go outside and relay race later. Okay. Um, and so... What, what would be the situation? Because hand-to-hand combat with somebody who's maybe six foot five, 300 pounds, I, would, I don't care how much tactical training you Correct. think I have. I'm, there's a very good chance, like, I will go down. Mm-hmm. And what do I do then? And so I really... What did they say? I was told that if you're in a situation and the person is unarmed, but you think your life is in danger, you can shoot. I agree with that 100%. I was told that. They're like, just make sure, you know, there were certain things they wanted me to check, distance, space. Could I get away? Could I avoid shooting that person? Mm -hmm. You know, all those things. But if you're in a place where you think you're going to go down, because actually what a lot of people don't realize, and I'm an adjunct professor. I teach, don't laugh. I teach criminal justice and criminology, and I have this discussion a lot with my students because they're very curious. They want to understand how it works. But the concern is not only that I'm going to get hit and go, my lights are out. It's like I go down, but then now... My service weapon, which I am responsible for, someone else can take that. Yep. And if they take that, I am in so much trouble. Like, there's so many consequences to that. And uh, if you look at the data, in 88% of the situations where a police officer's gun was taken, that gun was used against the police officer. I've seen videos of that online. Yeah, that makes sense. I know... I know of officers, I've had conversations with them where they're in a position now where they're so hesitant. I think they would be very hesitant to defend themselves with lethal force in an environment where the person is unarmed because of the scrutiny they would get afterwards. And the situations that they describe to me sound 100%, like that's 100% legitimate. They should be able to do whatever they need to do to protect their life, a threat to their life. And I feel bad for them. It's a rough environment right now for law enforcement, for sure. The body cams, unfortunately... They only want to put on the news, you know, the snippet of a shooting. What they should put up every single day is body cam footage of incidents going exactly the way that the general public would expect. Traffic stops. Hey, how's it going? Just doing their job. Hey, here's a here's a body cam footage. And people are like, oh, who's going to get shot? Oh, nobody. It's just a normal (laughs) interaction with a civilian populace like they're supposed to do. They're out there interfacing. Like, look, here's a good example of things going right. That never makes the news. It doesn't. And. You know, I because I did the news quite a bit, um, 
it, it, it doesn't keep people, it doesn't keep viewers on. Yeah. People want to watch the bad stuff. People want to see the drama. And I think... And it I taints studied, their perception, though. It does. And I think what's sad is, like, the news has become almost like drama. Like, you're watching, you're watching another reality... TV show. Just TV show. Yeah. I don't know if it's actually even the news anymore. It's pr- very highly editorialized. Yeah. But I digress. So you're in the Secret Service portion <laughs> now. 54 women started with you? No, no. Four women. Went, uh, so how about in Fletzy? How many women were there in that class? It was the same class. Okay. We were the same. So we're the same group, 54. Oh, you all went to... We all go together. Okay. They kept us together. So we all go together. I think, I think everybody passed. Okay. We all went through it. And then, because when you're in this, when you're in the service, they treat you more as an individual because they've really invested a lot of time in you. And you're there with people. I actually think one of the guys in my class was a former SEAL. Probably. I had a former Ranger in my class. I mean, I had, I was in there and I was like, wow, look at these amazing people. And then I'm like, how did I end up in this? (laughs) Because I was quiet. They're like, where are you from? I'm like, oh, NYPD. Meanwhile, they had like no idea. I only did like four or five months in the academy. Yeah. Um, so once you pass, then you go to the second phase, which is Beltsville, and then it's the same group. But they really do invest time in you. They do treat you as an individual. But I, I don't want to say it wasn't harder. I think NYPD was harder for me because I walked in clueless, and I didn't know what to expect. And then I, I was much more aware of what would be expected of me when I went into the service. I still worked out. I still did everything, even in training. I pick the bigger guys because sometimes they'd want to pair me with someone small, another woman. Mm-hmm. And I'd really get annoyed because in the street, she's not, I don't, yeah, you're not, not going to get the opportunity. Yeah. With, it's going to be a big guy who I'm going to be fighting with. Let me fight. Let me roll with this person because this is who I need to be worried about. And so sometimes you'd see the instructors kind of be unsure. And it's like, no, I'm, I'm not a female special agent. I'm just a special agent. Treat me the same way. Beat me up the same way because I'm going to die out there if you don't, you don't do that. Mm-hmm. If you cater to me, I, you're, you're, you're handicapping me. Yeah, you're not actually helping the you're individual. You're not helping me. Yeah. And so we went through that training, and I do believe it's changed quite a bit. We had like an O course and all mm-hmm. these different things, and I, pa- I passed all that stuff too, but I put, I put my soul into it. I put everything I had into it. And then, so what does the journey look like after that? So you make it through Fletzy, you make it through the Secret Service portion of that academy. Then you actually become a federal agent at the end of the Secret mm-hmm. Service Academy. You get offered your job. Are you guys paid on a GS pay system? Yes, okay. GS scale. I think I was a GS, I want to say a seven. Which is a government service pay scale, which I know right. almost nothing about for people listening. So go to Google if you want to know more about that. The good thing about pay scales is that it just goes on time. So nobody's yeah. arguing or bickering. It's like, you start on the state, this is a skill you're on. You start on the state, this is a skill you're on. And as you grow in seniority, yep. the numbers go up. Navy's the same way. The, the, you could go, hey, if you've been in two years and you're in E2, this is, is an Excel spreadsheet problem. It's X, right. Y. Yeah. Exactly. It's actually nice. But nobody really goes, I don't think, into the military for money, as I would assume no. <laughs> that path as well. So what's it look like when you start that journey? So when you graduate, everybody gets sent to a field office. I... Usually they try to send you somewhere that you're not from, but I'm from New York. They sent me back to New York. And my understanding was, <laughs> I asked, I'm like, why am I going back to New York? Well, I was happy. They're like, oh, nobody wants New York. Really? No, because if you're on this GS7 pay scale, I can live in Montana Ooh. like a king. Yeah. And in New York, I can get like a little apartment the size of your bathroom. And yeah, shoebox. Like yeah. And so the quality of life and a lot of people did not want New York. And I also, I hate to say it, but we used to work. A lot in New York, obviously, there's more crime. There's a lot more things happening. And so you're working a lot more cases. Also in New York, you have the United Nations. And so a lot of people don't realize that the U.S. Secret Service also protects foreign heads of state. So when you have a foreign head of state coming to the United States, they automatically get Secret Service protection because huh. we, don't, we don't want anybody getting assassinated on U.S. soil. You don't want the prime minister of Israel or somebody coming over and then getting... Do they get a full detail or just... Yes, wow. yes. I've probably protected... I, I can't count, but maybe a third of the world's leaders just because they come to the U.S. and a lot of them would come to, to New York because of the U.N. Mm-hmm. But they, people don't realize it's not just the U.N. General Assembly that happens in September. People coming to the U.N. all year round. In a lot of these countries, they have houses here. One guy had apartments. I remember, what do we call him? I, I won't say what country, but we used to call him the slumlord because he used to go collect rent. He owned property. A lot of um, foreign heads of state send their kids here to school. Yep. They come here. One country, one uh, head of state, he came to the U.S. for medical treatment. He didn't want to get it in his own country, 
So he came to the U.S. So it was a revolving door of protection. protection. And then while you're doing that, then you would help and do supplemental protection for our protectees, which was the president, former presidents, and their spouses. So sometimes we would help with And that's those. for life. They get it for life. It recently changed though, right? Isn't Obama the last one he's going to get for 10 years? I don't know what they're doing with that. I remember Clinton created a, there was a law that Clinton passed or it was, it passed through his administration that everybody hit, um, he going backwards, basically he would get it for life and Mm -hmm. anybody before him would get it for life. And then after him, they would only get it for 10 years because there was a life to life expectancy issue where we had all these protect these living longer lives and we're, trying to protect them all. And so the thought process was, does, you know, former President Ford, who had protection, does he still really need it? Does Carter yeah. really need it at this point? Well, Are they can they, probably decrease the detail size, I would imagine, is there... They do decrease it. Yeah. But it's still costly. Oh, for sure. It's very costly. You're talking about vehicles. You're talking about travel. You're talking about admin. You're talking about even fortifying or, secu- you know, the security parameters around there. I was in the Delta Lounge in L.A. and Carter... President Carter came in. <laughs> Did he come over? No. <laughs> I sat there and I watched the Secret Service agents like moving around. I'm like, mm-hmm. I wonder what's going on here. I just sat there quietly. I'm like, okay, everybody have a nice day. <laughs> it's like that movie where it was a guarding test. Yes. <laughs> Nobody knew what was going on. Like it freaks people out. I, it was funny. I saw a car pulled up, actually a motorcade pulled up yeah. uh, by the plane. And I looked out there and I was like, oh, that's a little interesting. People got out of the out of the vehicles and assumed a defensive posture. I'm like, oh, I know what's going on. I didn't know who it was. He popped out. I was like, oh, that's cool. Yeah. Didn't know he was going to be coming into the lounge. Comes into the lounge, sat in the corner, and then they went and got him on a commercial flight. But I bet they have to have people on the flight with them, all that stuff. And there's a cost to that for sure. All of that. Yeah. Because you have shifts. You also have advanced people, the advanced yep. people that go out ahead of time, as you know, to check a place out before somebody's going to go there, whether it's domestic or overseas. It's very costly. But I think now... I thought I heard that they changed that now everybody still gets it for life because I think they realized that it's something that they should have. Yeah. So, but you didn't start off in protection. I'm curious, but so you said you started off as an investigator. So I work as an investigator. We have squads. I started off in the financial fraud squad. And so I started doing cases that involved um, tr- the treasury department and all that. And then I worked counterfeiting. I wasn't in that squad, but you would sometimes do it. Then credit card fraud squad. Then we had... Um, we also had electronic crime squad where we would look at people doing, and it was, it was kind of new us still at the time where people were committing crimes through the internet. One of the big ones was um, pedophilers. When they would try to lure, connect with people online, kids online, befriend them, and then try to get them to meet somewhere. And so I was part of that. It was one occasion they were going to, because of what I looked like they were, and I was very young back then, they were going to put me on a corner in the middle of Manhattan to meet with somebody that we were chatting with. And so I would ID him, and the minute I ID'd him, we, I'd be like, yep, this is the guy, take him down. But from far away, they thought I'd look like a kid, so I would work. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I don't know if this is a compliment or an insult. But, but how I, did that fall into the, how did the pedoph- a, pedophilia fall into the Secret Service umbrella? They have, elect- it's, it's uh, an electronic crime. So we had jurisdiction. So electronic over. crimes also fall under the Secret yeah. Service. So there were times where we would work cases and we'd kind of connect with maybe the FBI or another agency. And then we'd just say, all right, look, we're both on this. Let's just team up and do it together. Yeah. So we, so a lot of any crime that was happening online or through the internet or in that way, we would get involved. In, and I think we were one of the first ones to create a task force for that. We had a really sophisticated task force. They were very good. So you work in that capacity. And then while I was doing that, we had poly- polygraphers. Um, there were maybe, I don't know if I'm allowed to see how many, but there's a very, very small group of polygraphers in the U.S. Secret Service. And they asked me, do you, there's an opening, do you want to, one of the senior guys came up to me, he's like, you should put in for this. He's like, I'm leaving, I'm going to the president's detail, why don't you take my spot? And I was like, no, thank you. I was like, I don't want it. Because it was a really, one, it was a huge responsibility because you were the person they called when there's a case yeah. and they can't solve it, there's not enough proof and they need a confession or they need information. And if you don't get that, like you're, it's, it's bad. It's a, it's a huge, it's a heavy burden because everyone's looking at you. And if there's times where you can't get everybody to talk and people look at you, is it the person? Is it you? So it was a huge responsibility. Then plus, I remember thinking like, who's going to talk to me? I was like, you need somebody big and bald and scary in that room who's going to scare the bejesus out of people, not someone like myself. And the polygrapher at the time, the senior guy, he said, I think you're looking at this wrong. He's like, I think people will be more inclined to speak to you. 
because they're not going to come in defensive. Their walls will be down. And he's like, and I really, he's like, I don't think you understand what it really means to interrogate someone. And I put in for it. I did not think I was going to get it. And I was selected out of a, a, a large group of people. I was surprised I got it. And then I was sent now to the Department of Defense. It was called DODPI at, at the time. I know not now it has a different acronym, but it was Department of Defense Polygraph Institute. So you go there, and it's the who's who of interrogators. So every agency sends their people there, FBI, DEA, mm -hmm. military. And we all go there, and it's, it was probably one of the hardest schools I've ever been to. Probably really? the hardest, yes. Cause it was How long was it? Three months. Wow. Oh, it's a three-month school. So you learn everything about physiology. And it's, it was literally a physiology course, a graduate course that you learned in a week. I remember reading a textbook cover to cover, and I'm like, they can't, they can't be serious. And they were. And they were happy to fail you out of that school. Um, so I went there, and they teach you psychology. They have, you know, professors coming in, teaching you about medicine, too. Like if people take some type of drug, what it does to them. Um, the mindset of people, it was more of a the psychology of people. And then they also teach you techniques, how to listen information, how do you influence people, how do you get people to talk to you? Because I'm a federal law enforcement agent. I have to Mirandize people. Mm -hmm. This is at the time. I have to Mirandize. I'm not there to browbeat people. I have to be careful. So it's like, how do I get people to confess to a crime or to give me information when there's no benefit to it? You know, sometimes it's like you talk to me and the potential of Jill is like right here. And how do you do that? So it was a really intense school. And I went through that. That was three months. And it was actually, we trained at Fort, Fort Jackson. Mm -hmm. Fort Jackson on the army base. Uh, we trained and then we practiced on recruits. I felt so bad. That's so fucked up. <laughs> we practiced on recruits. <laughs> but they were, they were the recruits they were going to send home. There's a name for them. Do you know what they're, what are they called, Andy? When you go into the military and then... <laughs> They realize that you're not fit for it, for it, and they let you go home. Oh, there is a name for that, but it's escaping me at the moment. Those were the ones that we practiced on, not the ones that stayed. So, did I they guess. have to volunteer for it, or did they have a choice? I don't think they had a choice. I don't think they probably did either. That's an interesting pool of people to practice on. We did. I mean, it wasn't brutal or anything. We just it was just really practicing on a person, and they understood that it was for a practice. They understood that we were students trying to learn this craft. Yeah. Um, but it was the only way that they could just teach us how to do it before you go to the real thing. Then after you graduate, even though you go out there, at least my agency did not allow me to do polygraphs right away. I think I had to do maybe about 35 or 40 with a, with a senior person. Yeah. And then that person has to sign, off on, sign off on every time I did a test. And especially if they were recorded, so they would listen. And then so I began doing the polygraphs now for our applicants. Uh, those people who wanted to work for us, they had to take a poly and pass it. And then I started doing polygraphs related to our jurisdiction, the different cases that we would work. And then we would sometimes be lent out to police departments who did not maybe have the resources to investigate a case or needed help. And we would go out and do cases for them. So if I had, I did a lot of, I did quite a few child abuse cases where you'd have children who were a broken arm or fractured skull, and they'd say, we think it's the dad, we think it's the mom, we think it's the nanny, we have no proof, can you help us? And I would go in, and I would usually try to interview first the, the primary suspect, the person we suspected, and I'd go in, and I'd talk to that person, and my goal was to either clear them, because sometimes mm -hmm. people are, they're not the person, it's the wrong person, or get a confession. And so I'd travel the country on loan, and I wasn't the only one, other agents did as well, when we would do crimes that were not under our jurisdiction, but violent crimes, um, maybe a murder, a missing kid, or anything like, anything where we would help police departments because not everybody's the NYPD. NYPD has 40,000 police officers. They have the resources. But half of the police departments in the United States have, um, they're about 10 officers or less. And so it's those departments that need, they need help. They don't have the training. They don't have the resource. So we'd go in and try to help them out. Do people have to agree to sit with you yes. and take that polygraph test? Absolutely. They, ha they have to consent. It's like in inter any interview. Nobody has to talk to you. And so I would Mirandize, I would Mirandize everybody yeah. because one of my concerns was if this person starts saying something to me, I don't want to be like, well, let's stop right there. I'm going to Mirandize you. Yeah, you got to. So <laughs> I would. Hold on with the confession. <laughs> <laughs> Hold that thought. Yeah. And Tell so me more in a minute. <laughs> so what we would do is what they taught us to do is no matter who you interview, even if it was an applicant, everybody got Mirandized. And I, 
Everybody. I was like, hey, this is just what we do, which I appreciated because it was just policy. Didn't matter who we talked to, you're getting Mirandized. And then by that point, it's kind of put to the side. It's forgotten. They know their, their, their rights. But then also there were little things you had to do in the room. So I had to make sure that like my chair didn't block the entrance of the door. I would ver- be very clear and say, hey, here's the door. I'd open the door. It's unlocked. You are free mm-hmm. to leave at any time. And I think the more I would say that to people, the more inclined they were to actually stay in the room. And it's kind of autonomy. It's, the, it's an actually an influence strategy. But when people feel like they have a choice, they feel like they have more control, so they're more inclined to go along with something or agree with you. Even if they know they're guilty, they would still sit there and try to go through the polygraph? What I, I Actually, what I found, and I don't know if there's data on this, but I found that guilty people tended to be the people that wanted to stay. And I noticed that those that I thought that were innocent would get up and leave. And I think the rationale behind it, and this is just my belief, was that guilty people really want to convince you, hey, I didn't do it. It's like, think about like a car salesman trying to sell you a lemon. He works really, really, really hard to convince you, no, this is a great car. Where if it was just a great car, he'd be like, this is a great car. If it was like a Maserati, he'd be like, it's a Maserati. Look yeah, at stickers it. on the window. You want it? Great. And so I really think that it was the same way in that room. So guilty people would really work hard because they want you to go away. Because if they get up and leave, they're going to okay. be like, well, they're still looking at me. So they want to convince you, I didn't do it. And I would find that guilty people would tend to stay in the room. I mean, there were a few people I knew were guilty that would leave. Um, but a lot of them would want to stay. They want to convince you, hey, I didn't do this. Was it the machine that would give them away more or their behavior? So it's the behavior. The polygraph itself, it's, it's actually right now it's a laptop. It's a software system. and It's not allowed in court, is it? No. no. Why is that? Because it's a, it can be subjective. Because you know why? Because if I suck, if I'm not good. Oh, as the administrator. Administrator. Like I can ask you a question and then I'm just going to bang the, bang the table or nudge the table as I'm asking you the question. You know what you're going to do? You're going to spike. Or I, can, you know, or I can inflect my voice a certain way. And you can so elicit a response. I can, yes. You can, if you're unethical, you can, try, you can make somebody fail. And so that you really have to be very, very careful. So really the polygraph was just a tool because as many people as I've interviewed, there are some people I would talk to and I'm like, I have no clue. Mm-hmm. This person's, I don't know. I don't know if they're telling me the truth and I don't know if they're a liar. So I, I'm, when people say, oh, I know I can spot a liar, you can't. It's, there's some people, they're just good. So the, the polygraph itself was a tool for you to see the physiological responses going on in that body. And so, but you would spend, the first part of the polygraph, you would spend time talking to people and sometimes their behaviors or their language, their verbal language or paralinguistics were so powerful that I remember thinking, I don't need to polygraph them. I've already got them and I think I can just get them to tell me. So a lot of times we'd call that a pretest confession where you talk to someone and you're connecting, you've got great rapport and then they're opening up. And And they just decide to confess. Yeah. That's a shitty criminal. (laughs) <laughs> I am not a criminal, but I think that's a shitty criminal. I think, <laughs> you know, it's interesting because if I look back at those people who would confess, it was easier to get somebody con- to confess to a violent crime than it was to a financial crime. So I'm going to put that out there and you tell me why you think that is. Easier to confess to a violent crime than a financial crime. I would say because they are probably proud of their machismo when it comes to the <laughs> violent crime, if it's a guy. Like, they're less concerned with, like, yeah, I did it. I was standing up for myself. Whereas a financial crime, I don't know. It seems dirtier. It seems dirtier. It's interesting. Everybody has such a unique perspective. Most people, when they commit some type of violent crime, whether it's an assault or a robbery or anything like that, there's more guilt attached to it. Because you're, physically, really? you're physically hurting somebody. You're physically doing something to someone. Financial crime, I could sit in my pajamas in Russia and like steal money out of your account or from my house. Oh, you're detached from you're detached. the actual physical pain. that you're Because you're definitely, if you screw somebody financially, there, there's pain associated with that too. <laughs> but you're okay. not, you're not feel, you don't feel like you directly did something to them. So sometimes it would be harder to get somebody to confess to like $50 worth of fraud than mm-hmm. it would be to, uh, to a crime, a violent crime. It's interesting. I wouldn't have thought about it that it was the guilt was the driving factor and the connectiveness to the, the impact that it had. It, look, it depends on the person. Some people you would get, they don't care. Most people feel bad. Like, I think as people, we have, 
I can't say this. In my experience, I've never interviewed someone where I said this person is 100% evil. There'd be elements of both good and bad in people. And sometimes I think the bad element would outweigh the good element in some people. And so in the interview room, my goal was to chase the good. I'd call it chasing the good. Because if I talked to you and treated you like garbage, I'm going to get garbage. And they're going to shut down. They're going to shut down. But if I try to find that part of you, that human element, that good part of you, and pull it out, say, like, Andy, I know you're a nice guy. I know you're an honest person. I know you want to do the right thing here. And when you take that approach, some people it works with, some people it connects with. You connect with them. And in truth, I... It wouldn't work on me. Either. <laughs> well, I have a polygraph set up right after. Send it. I've taken one before. <laughs> That's the next episode. <laughs> next episode on Cleared Hot. Oh, God. We'll do Andy's a Q&A. Polygraph. We'll Send your questions Q&A. in. Q&A. I'll just be like, ha, ha. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever... I would do it. I would do it. We, I mean, because, you know, there's two different types. There's like the security clearance polygraph, and then there's a lifestyle polygraph. I never got to the point where you had to take the lifestyle polygraph, which I also wouldn't care. I mean, I'm a relatively open book. Uh, but yeah, it's, it trips some people out for sure. What's the craziest polygraph interview you ever gave? What's one that sticks out in the most? It's not mine. There are other ones that I'd heard of. I'll share it. It's like pretty crass, but. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me more. We would, people would confess to bestiality. I never had it because I guess it's it. not popular on the East Coast. <laughs> But I would hear other polygraphers in the Midwest and different parts of the country. Why has it got to be the Midwest? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we don't really have that problem in New York City. But so I remember the first time I, I heard about it, I didn't know what it meant. I was like, what's a bestiality? Oh, like? God. So do you want to explain to your listeners? No, they, they can Google is? that if they want to. But you might show up on a list somewhere. So just use with caution. <laughs> so those would be the ones that animals. I always... Just animals. Special relationships with animals. Yeah, special friends. Emphasis <laughs> on the special. So those were always... I never... I, truth, I've never gotten one. Yeah, that's good. I'm glad that you didn't. I would hope that there are very few people like that actually... Maybe I wasn't good at my job. I'm trying to think back now. Maybe I should have pushed on that question a bit more. I don't think you should have. I think you <laughs> took the appropriate tact. So when did you shift from investigative to protection yeah, because I'm assuming while you were doing investigations you still have to stay current in the protective details you still stuff. do all that stuff so yeah. I'm doing all of these things now but one of the myths or a lot of people think that when you join the, the U.S. Secret Service you automatically go to the president's detail yes you do not direct pipeline from graduation yes. to the inner <laughs> Hi, circle <laughs> I'm here <laughs> step aside <laughs> um, you do not and not everybody gets it there's a selection process so you think of it and I know in the SEALs there's different divisions mm-hmm. Um, and if you want to go to a certain division, I yeah, think you apply it's Dev for, Group. Yeah, you, you apply for you additional apply, screening. Yep. And you go through additional screening. And then if you make it and if you're selected, then you go. So the president's detail, a, a current president, he has to be in office. Uh, that's, that process is like that. So phase one of your career is kind of what we just discussed, working cases. And in my situation, I just happened to become a polygrapher, which is uh, not the typical thing other agents did. Maybe less than 1% of us did that. But then phase two is they come to you, they say, listen, now you have to do a full-time protection assignment or phase two assignment. So it can be the president, it can be the vice president, or it can be a former president, like the ones we discussed, where maybe it's not as intense um, and you probably have a, a way better quality of life when you do those. I bet. Probably way more scheduled. Yes. Less, uh, less, less pressure intense. on the schedule too. Less intense. And you, pro- you have more of a life. It's more of your life. And then there's also other divisions where you can do intelligence. So we have different branches. They were, so I was at the point where they were like, you have to leave New York. And so me being a true New York, I'm like, I don't want to leave New York. This is a great place. Why would I go anywhere else? I was like, well, if you're going to make me leave, I'll go to DC and I'll, I'll try out for the president's details. So just like everybody else, I put my name in and then eventually you're called. And this is, it took about seven or eight years for me to get this, to this point, just to give you an idea of how long you have to wait to go. So you became a federal agent pre-9-11. I did. You were in New York then, I'm assuming, on 9-11. Our offices were in um, Seven World Trade Center. Where were you that day? I was in the office. I went in early. I was working on a case. I was chasing, uh, I was trying to find this Frenchman who was committing fraud. And I believed he was in Canada. And I was... Goddamn Frenchman. <laughs> and he they're was frauds. in Canada. <laughs> and I went in early. And I was in the office, and I heard the first plane hit. So before I answer, because I think I know where you're going with this, 
when you, you've obviously been in situations and do you ever struggle talking about them sometimes? Because you feel like maybe you're doing an injustice by speaking about it or elevating yourself or I'm not sure if I'm articulating it right, but do you ever feel? I don't, I try and I have always tried to be just as objective and honest as I can be. And that in t includes my own behavior in those situations. I, f I, I probably err on the side when I talk about things in my past of telling people how I screwed up more than when I was successful because I prefer to leave it to my peers and the people that I was there with to talk about any successes I may have had. So it's easier for me in that respect to just try to be blanket honest with it. Like, hey, this is what I experienced. Somebody's experience might have been different. This is what I saw. Right. But I've been able to navigate that well by just having that as the baseline with which I operate from. So, yeah, full disclosure, it's always been hard for me to discuss that day because I guess I always felt that all these people died. And I, you know, I didn't, I survived. And I always really had a struggle. And I always felt internally... I shouldn't discuss it as much. And it yeah. was hard for me. I wrote it about it in the book and it's really been, you have this part of you. It's like, should I even be talking about this? Is it wrong for me to share my story? So I was just curious to see like how you perceive something like that. Well, I didn't have any direct, I mean, you obviously have deep ties to New York, you know? So I think that that day outside of your federal job probably would have had a, a pretty big impact. Uh, I had no direct connection to that. I, you I joined pre 9 11. I did. I joined in 96. You were like a baby when you joined. Well, they don't actually take babies. I was 18, <laughs> so yes, I was still a baby. Emotionally, I was probably nine at the time I joined the military when they gave me my first machine gun. It's not a good call. Right now, I'm currently sitting at like 18 emotionally, and I'm 42. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I watched, I turned the TV on about 10 seconds before the second plane went in live. I had no idea what was going on. I literally just woke up, turned the TV on. Um, so 9-11 for me was more of a shift in my life because it was a drastic shift in my occupation. But I didn't, you know, there was no issues with uh, talking about it or what I would describe a lot of people say is survivors, survivor's guilt because A, I wasn't there. And B, I had no direct attachment to it. There are issues from... What about your tactical stuff when you're... That's so what I was going to say. There are, there, yeah, there's plenty of situations where I fell completely short of the standard that I set for myself. And there are days where I feel like I met the standard. And there were most of the days in my military career were awesome. I mean, the people I worked with were great in large, you know, every, every weed uh, lawn has weeds mm -hmm. to include the SEAL oh, teams. Yeah. So most of the people I worked with were great. And I tried to minimize the time with the people I didn't want to work with. Most of the time, we had overwhelming tactical success on the battlefield because we had the tactical and technological advantage, which is awesome. And it, it felt great to go over there and feel like you're making a difference. And then there's sometimes where it's a complete and utter shit show and your good friends died and things that were outside of your control uh, occurred. And, you, you know, you struggle with it. And, you know, a helicopter would go down. And you're like, why wasn't I on that helicopter? Or somebody would get blown up or shot and well, I went through that door too. Why didn't that happen to me? And I don't, I, I guess for me, it's maybe cathartic to talk about it. Um, and I, but again, I just try to go with just, just full honesty. Like, Hey, this is what happened. This is what I was trying to do. This is what I was actually able to do. And I'll just stand in judgment of my peers. I hear that. So like, so for us on that day, it was, so it's, a, it's such a difficult thing to talk about, but because it's you, Andy. Um, we, I had gone into work, and we were in Seven World Trade Center, and I was trying to work on this case, and we're sitting there. Um, I was with the liaison, I want to say with Customs at the time, and we hear the sound outside, and I honestly didn't realize it was a plane. I just heard like, this loud sound. How close was where you were to... Uh, which tower was hit first? Was it one World Trade Center? I should know this. I want to say, I always mix the towers up. I don't remember which one offhand was hit first. It was, it was the one closest to my building. Okay. It was the one, I want to say it's the North Tower. The North. The one okay. that was closest North. Um, no, I don't want to say because I can't remember at the moment. So we were, so the way it's set up, World Trade Center, it was 
Tower 1, Tower 2, and then around the towers at the base, there was, it was World Trade Center 4, 5, 6, mm -hmm. these lower buildings, and then right adjacent to that, they built 7 World Trade Center, which was about 47 stories. And so we're so, only talking a couple blocks. No, it's not a couple blocks. It's like across the street. They're right okay. next to each other. So everything's in the same vicinity. Literally, to get to the tower, because our parking garage was actually underneath the towers. So I'd go in, I'd park under the towers, the two big towers, mm -hmm. and then just cross. Uh, there was a walkway. I just crossed the walkway, and now I'm in Seven World Trade Center. So we are there. You hear the, the loud sound. Sound it didn't even occur to me that was an explosion. Everybody goes to the windows. Um, some people still aren't there because it was still early. And I look out and I see this big fire, this blazing fire coming from the top of the tower, the first tower that had been hit. It was up top high. And I remember thinking it was a very benign thought. I remember thinking, oh, I, I think it's an electrical fire. It didn't even, nobody, none of us had any idea that a plane or anything, zero, were completely mm -hmm. clueless. And then on the PA system, they say everybody, it comes on, it says everybody evacuate, everybody evacuate. So not knowing what's going on, I remember I run over to... I run up to my desk and I grab my, my gun and my badge because I was just like, I have to have these. I didn't know what was going on. We evacuate, we go down. And then as we go down to the lobby, you just, it was like floor to ceiling glass, the lobby of the Seven World Trade. And you just saw chunks of steel coming down and people couldn't exit. So then the security, the building security were pushing people out through the side mm -hmm. and they're just yelling to everybody, everybody evacuate. And I remember pausing and I think at the time I was by myself I'm thinking, I'm like, wow. I'm not evacuating. Like, we don't evacuate. I'm not supposed to evacuate. And I started looking around for my colleagues. And I found a small group of colleagues, maybe about six of us, six of them. And I said, what do we do? And they're like, let's go get our medical kits. We had these medical kits. They were called fat kits. Mm -hmm. um, so we'd go up. These things were huge and heavy. They had everything in there. So we go up. And this, we went to the area where we stored our weapons and our, our kits. They were all in the same area. We obviously didn't grab weapons because we didn't really think we needed them. We, didn't, we still didn't know what was going on. We grabbed yep. the medical kits, and we go down and then out through the side of Seven World Trade to go towards the tower that had been hit to try to get in to help the injured people because we knew people were going to be injured and, and wounded. And as literally as we're walking toward the tower to go into it, then I just heard a really loud sound. It sounded like a, an engine revving. And it was coming from above. I didn't see it. And one of the agents that was with me, he grabbed my arm and he yanked me. And he just, I didn't really understand what was happening. He starts pulling me and he starts pulling me back in the direction of where we came. And then I just see everybody running. And then I hear the sound of the plane. I'm still, I, I don't know it's a plane. I don't understand it's a plane. I just hear the sound. I'm thinking, is it a missile? Is it, what is this? And we run. And then just as we're running, sure enough, just, that I, at that time, the tower, the plane hits the other tower, mm -hmm. and all the debris comes shooting out, and it shooting out in our direction, and so it's just literally, Andy, it's just raining chunks of building, steel and fireball. It was, it was. There are no words to describe it. There, there, the stuff they show on air, they don't show. It just doesn't. There's no justice to what it really was. Yeah. So we start. We just run. And I remember the agent actually landed on top of me. He slammed me up against the concrete wall. There was a wall there, and he slammed me up, and, and he shielded me. He put his body over mine, just a friend, a colleague, and just instinctually, he tried to protect me. And we sat there, and we waited for the rain of stuff to stop. And I remember just looking around, just seeing people just getting smacked with chunks of steel. Yeah. And you were either there, or then you were gone. It was like... It was a very surreal thing to experience. So when that happened, it occurred to us, all right, this is, we still didn't know it was a plane, by the way. No clue. We realized this is something else. This is an attack, a terrorist attack, some type of attack. And so our, now the way we were going in is now blocked because now the second plane came and put all that debris and fire in our path. So we had to go around a different way. And then actually as we went around that way, some NYPD cops stop us and they're like, hey, we need your help because they saw our badge and guns, because we weren't covered at the time. And like, we have a guy we think, it's like the hottest thing, he's like, we think he's, he's saying some weird stuff, we don't know what to do. And so we walk over, and it's like raining debris, and there's this guy standing there with a hoodie, and he's looking up, and I'm like, what are you doing? And he's where nobody is, and he's like, I think they missed their mark. I was like, what? He's like, they missed the mark. And I'm like, well, who missed the mark? He's like, the planes, they hit the wrong spot. So we hear this, and we're thinking, what the... So I remember we grab him, 
We're like, hey, why don't you just come over here and let's talk where it's not raining debris. And we're talking to him and he starts saying these things and we didn't know what to do. And the cops were like, I'm like, we can't let this guy go. We don't know what this is. So we put handcuffs on him right away and we search him. And then when I searched him, I found some paperwork that he had just come from court, he, some parole hearing. And then I was talking to him and it turns out he happened to be Greek. I'm like, are you Greek? And I start talking to him in Greek. And then I realized I'm talking to him. I'm like, I think this guy has mental health issues. I'm like, don't let him go though. We don't know what this is. So we gave him to the cops. They, they had their car there. I'm like, take him. Make sure he gets interviewed. We don't know what this is. Just, I don't think it is anything, but just take him. And I remember the cops looking at me and I was with my, another partner of mine at the time, the, the same agent that shielded me. And they were like, aren't you going to come? And then we, my partner and I looked at each other. He's like, no, we're going to stay. And so I remember the cops left and they hugged, <laughs> they hugged us before they left. So then we go, we link up with some other agents. I found a small group of agents and a boss and the boss stops us all and he's like, listen, he's like, I'm going in. He's like, whoever wants to come with me can come and whoever wants to go, you can go. No one's going to judge you. This is obviously like, unlike anything we've ever seen. And I didn't look, I just stepped forward. And as we get ready to go, like over in the distance, I hear somebody scream and then we look up and we're like, now we're like at, on the West Side Highway, mm -hmm. which is the street that's next to the towers. And we look up and there's somebody jumping and then another person and then another person. And Andy, it was just raining people. They were, it was, they were just, not only now are you worried about the debris coming down because we're like trying to shift to make sure nothing falls on us that's debris or metal. Now we're, we're running so we don't have a human being fall on us. Were they the people jumping from above the impact point? They wanted to avoid the fire? Yeah, there were some, they were jumping from, there was the fire, so they, they obviously couldn't get out. They were trapped. And I remember you could see them, like, hanging out yeah. the holes. They showed waving. that very briefly on the news. And they, they don't show it. Anymore, yeah. It was, I don't know how many people jumped out. I, it felt, and, I, and I'm probably wrong, but it felt like hundreds. When I say it, was, it wasn't one or two or three, people were jumping. It was raining people. And so now this is happening, and we're trying to get into the tower. We can't get into the tower, so by the West Side Highway... There was already people coming out, so we just set up a triage, and we just started helping people and giving oxygen, doing different things. And, just, and then ambulance trucks were pulling up, and so the people that we thought needed help, we throw them into the truck. Some people were just in shock. Like, they were, they were okay. They were covered and stuff, but you could tell they were just more like it was, they couldn't think. Yep. And we would just be like, go to the water. Just walk that way. So they'd go towards the water. And as that is happening... I remember at one point I was doing something. I was trying to get the oxygen tank to work to help this woman. And I hear quiet, like just quiet. And I look up and there's no one there, nobody. All my colleagues are gone. I'm like, what the, where did everyone go? And then I hear the sound of like, it's so hard to explain. It's just like the sound, the sound of bending steel. If you've ever been in a boat at the bottom of the boat, when you hear the, the noise the metal makes at the hull of a ship. Yep. It was that sound, but times, I don't know, 100. And I hear the sound and I'm thinking, oh, the roof must be sliding off because I remember the first plane hit the top of the tower and I'm thinking maybe that's given way. I was like, and I knew because of how close I was to the tower, I was like, I cannot run this. This thing's gonna fall. It's gonna take, it's like seven city blocks with it. So I was like, I have to hunker down. So I looked around and... I was outdoors, I was exposed, I, couldn't, I didn't even have time to run into any place, so there was a corner of the building that I found like a brick corner, made like this perpendicular angle, and I remember thinking like, I'll sit here, and maybe when the tower collapse, the, the stuff comes, it'll shoot over my head, maybe it'll shield me. But when they say time slows down, this is the only time in my career that this has happened. I've been in tactical situations or different things, nothing very extreme, nothing like what you've, you've encountered, but this is the only time in my life where I'm like, that, that shit is real. When they say time slows down, I was like, what do I need? Water. My, my brain just went into automatic mode. I need water. Why do I need water? If I get buried, I need water to drink. I grabbed water. Then there was a metal table. And I was like, look, if steel falls on me, there's nothing that that can do. But glass can kill. A lot of people don't realize that glass is just as dangerous. So, Especially at high velocity. Yes. So I was like, what can I use to shield myself? So at that area, because of the way the area was designed, they had a lot of outdoor tables and patios where people would eat. You know those big heavy metal tables that 
people eat at outside a restaurant. I saw one. That thing was, it must have weighed twice my, twice my weight. I remember grabbing it and my adrenaline just kicking in. And I, I dragged that thing. I remember scraping the concrete with it. And I shoved it into the corner. And I'm like, all right, if the, de- the tower doesn't kill me or whatever's coming doesn't kill me. I didn't know the tower's coming down. Mm-hmm. I, just, I really thought it was just the top part of it or a portion of it. I was like, so if that doesn't crush me, at least I've got this to shield me from glass. I've got water. I'll figure it out. And I got into that corner and I made myself, and I'm small to begin with. I remember I made myself so small, <laughs> teeny tiny. I'm like, I remember I put my knees into my chest. I was like, do I have all my toes in? And you were by yourself. There was nobody else there with by you. By myself. I remember thinking, I'm like, couldn't one of these guys tap me on the shoulder and be like, hey, Ev, so come they had with just, us? So they had bolted? Everybody bolted. I think it just happened so fast that everybody just went into an automatic mode and yeah. nobody thought to say, hey, to tap me on the shoulder to be like, hey, you might want to come with us. I just, I just ended up being by myself and I just sat there and I waited and it started to come down and it was like sitting in the middle of an earthquake or inside a volcano. It was, it was unlike anything I ever felt before. And I remember sitting there and as it started to happen, something hit me. I was like, I was like, oh my God, I'm, I'm going to die. I was like, this isn't what I thought. And I had that, that moment. I was like, I'm really going to die. And so I was like, all right, well, I don't have a choice whether I live or die. It's not my choice. I'm gonna, if I die, it's out of my hands. But I can choose how I'm going to die. And, and I was like, I'm not going to die afraid. And I remember sitting there, and, you know, I'm not an overly religious person. I don't go to church every Sunday, but in that moment, I was like, I'm going to pray. And I started praying out loud, and I asked God to forgive me. I was like, you know, God, I was like, I hope I've been a decent enough person and please forgive me and don't let me be alone when this happens. And it's interesting because I wasn't f- afraid of dying. I was sad because I was dying alone. It's just it's such a weird thing. Like, because when you do these jobs, when you put in to do something like this, you go in with the understanding I could die doing this job. But it, this was something different. And although I had not been prepared to die like this, you know, I always thought it'd be a bullet in the head or something. I'm like, oh, I'm good. But I didn't expect this. And I prayed and I just let it come. And I remember it just turned to night and this wave of heat and darkness just came in and you're just watching it come. And I was like, nope, I'm not going to die afraid. I'm going to keep my eyes open. I kept my eyes open. I was like, I want to know how I die. I want to see it happen. And just this, as I guess as the tower came down, the blast came and just, even though I was already in the corner, it just slammed me back into the the brick wall, and then it just, it just started coming down. And I thought for sure, I'm like, I'm done. And I waited, and it just kept coming down, coming down, and all the stuff was coming down, and I, it felt like an eternity. And then finally, all of a sudden, everything just goes quiet, just like deathly, like silent. And I sat there for a bit, and I was like, I think I'm dead. Because I couldn't see anything. And I remember taking my hand and putting it up in front of my face. And I was trying to look at my hand. It was like only two inches from my face. I couldn't even see my hand. And I was like, I, I don't know. I don't know what this is. And then I realized I started burning because I kept my... In uh, trying to be courageous, I ended up sabotaging myself because all the debris and all that ash came into my eyes and <laughs> was burning me. And I'm thinking, I'm like, man, I'm being brave and probably not the wisest thing to do. So my eyes started burning because all that stuff that fell on us... Um, my skin was okay, but it was just really the orifices of the body. Yeah. And I sat there for a bit because I was afraid I had been buried alive. And I was like, I might be buried. That's why I can't see anything. And I waited and I waited. And I, it might've been a good solid five minutes where then I put my hand out and I just started to slowly crawl out. And then I felt a wall and again, still, you can't see anything. And then eventually I saw like this light in the distance, this dim light. And so I just started crawling over to it and I stood there and then I heard a colleague call me. I don't know how he found me. And he's like, is that you, Ev? And I'm like, yes, it's me. And he's like, I was like, I can't see. And he's like, just stay where you are. He's like, I'll come grab you. And he came and got me. And as the dust started to clear a little bit, I mean, you looked around and it was just debris everywhere. I mean, firemen bleeding. Mm -hmm. And then it occurred to us, we're like, oh my, holy shit, there's another tower. If this thing came down, the other one's going to come down. And I still didn't, I did, I still did not know the tower came down. I, we had, I didn't understand what was happening. It was after this was all over 
that they were like, hey, a plane hit, then another plane hit, then the tower fell, then the other tower fell. No, no clue. And so after that, we, they took me into a lobby. There was a super there, and he cleaned my face because I was, I was really burning, and he cleaned my eyes. And then we just started evacuating people because all these... The thing with the towers, they were so huge that when they collapsed, when they spilled over, the, the chunks of debris actually scraped adjacent buildings. And some of the buildings, actually, they had to take them down after the whole incident happened because they were so structurally damaged mm -hmm. because the towers fell on them. So my building, Building 7... That building collapsed. I think our building collapsed at 5 p.m. that day, but it collapsed because when the tower fell, it fell on top of it. Mm -hmm. Our building caught fire. It burned until it went down. And so even after the first tower came down, we kind of regrouped and we started pushing people out because we're like, you know what? If this one fell, the other one's going to fall. And as we started to push people out, the second one started to fall too. And we were just pulling people, dragging people, lifting people. I remember we carried this one kid who... I don't know if he was handicapped, he couldn't walk. Somebody was screaming, help, he can't move. And we just picked him up and threw him into an ambulance. And it was, it was insanity that day. And then I remember that whole thing happened. And then, and then all of a sudden, we see, so after the second one falls, we all the fire trucks, all the first responders, everybody starts bolting. And I'm on the West Side Highway, still by ground zero, and the firemen are on top of their trucks. Everybody run, everybody get out of here. And I'm thinking, what, what, ha what else could happen? Gas leak. So everybody, oh, yes, everybody thought that when the tires collapsed, I guess there was a gas, a gas smell. And so all the fire trucks, everybody's blazing, blazing down the highway. And I'm on foot with my colleagues. We start running. We just start running. And we just ran as far as we could because we thought, we thought downtown Manhattan was gonna, going to explode. And so it was... It was crazy. I can't believe sometimes it's like it's 18 years ago, but we, you know, you do, you did the best you could. I mean, I did the best I could. And it, there's, there's moments where I think back, maybe I could have done this better or done that better, or gone in here. And it just makes you sad because you just see this massive loss of life. And you just, it was really hard to watch, you know, all those people die. And I mean, you come from a background and you're thinking, you're, I'm worthless. I can't do anything. I would say helpless, not worthless. Helpless. Helpless. Yes. You felt, but you know what? The, to be fair, I felt like that. I felt like, I, what can I do? And you've got your gun on you. I'm like, what's this going to do? Yeah. Your badge. Like, what? There's nothing. Nothing at that point. No. No. So that was, you know, a really life-changing experience. And I think sometimes we get caught up in life, and whenever I feel myself kind of shift, I'm like, ah, remember that day? Life's not so bad, or things are... It kind of brings you, brings you back. Sadly, though, there's a lot of folks still dying from I, the aftermath of 9-11. There's a, a program. It's called the World, World Trade Center Health Monitoring Program, which I'm part of. Every year I go, we all go, or most of us go, that we're there. They check us to make sure that we're okay because there's a lot of people that were there that, that were, worked there or helped there, and they suffered a lot of illnesses, and there's a lot of cancers. Yeah, the carcinogens coming up so you know it is what it is that story kind of hard thing yeah it was an interesting day for sure i wish our country would go back to how they behaved in the few weeks after that oh they loved us after that i was part of i would go in and help with the, the cleanup effort and th that part and we would drive down the west side highway there were people lined up all over the highway People from New York City holding up their signs. We love you. We love you, law enforcement. Because only law enforcement uh, was out, allowed inside. And first responders were allowed. And then the military came, the National Guard and all that. And they were just... And people came from all over the, the world um, to help. I remember there was uh, where our command post... We had a command post set up, the Secret Service, by Greenwich Avenue. And one day, one of the days, this, this big tractor trailer shows up. And they're hauling all this, this stuff. And it was like New Orleans and some restaurant from New Orleans... These people come out, they're like, hi, we're from New Orleans. We came up here and we're going to cook for you. And they just started pulling out these big tubs of gumbo and cooking gumbo in the middle of <laughs> Manhattan. Awesome. And I'm like, what's gumbo? This stuff is great. You know, I remember McDonald's too. They had, there was a McDonald's place and they had a little cart and you'd be sifting through different things. And there was a McDonald's uh, worker and he'd come up he's in the back. He'd have this towing, like, he's like, you want chicken McNuggets? You want Big Mac? You want filet fish What do you want? And 
They just don't they eat just, the fillet of fish. I don't like fillet of fish. My husband yeah. loves it. I think it's gross. It's disgusting. I'm pretty sure it's not fish, but I digress. <laughs> I uh, I found that people, even beyond their appreciation for law enforcement, they were the most compassionate I've ever seen strangers be towards each other for a few weeks after that. Like just everybody calmed the fuck down. And now that's gone. <laughs> I wish it would go back. I think it's gone because people don't, like for example, so I told you I teach uh, as an adjunct professor. My students, they weren't even, some of my students weren't, weren't even, even alive. born. Yeah. And so I don't think that they, for them it's something that happened in history. Like, oh, this happened, but it's, it happened way over there. And I think that's where the disconnect is. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think that you have to have something thrown in your face like that to recalibrate the context of who you are in your life and your station in society. I think sometimes maybe, you know how some countries make people, like everybody has to go into the military? Yeah, mandatory service. I really feel that something like that would really help people or help this country, just serving your country just so you can understand what it means and what you're doing and contributing. And then afterward, have your opinion. It would enhance their perspective for sure and give them a greater context of where they sit and where this country sits in a world stage for sure. I don't think it even has to be, I've talked about it before. Uh, if it was, if it was mandatory service, military cool, but also maybe the red cross is your thing or doctors without borders or something, some just service. Some, some service outside of yourself. Two years I think would be amazing. And if they could do it outside of the U S I think that would be even more impactful. Right. But even inside of the U S like just, serve something other than yourself for two years. I really think it would shift perspective and that shift in perspective would change the interactions with people have. I think it would do a lot uh, to enhance our society as a country for sure. I really, I really think that like this, look, my parents are immigrants and I'm, they're Greek. I was born here. The opportunities I've had in this country and I love where my parents came from. I love Greece too. I would have never, ever, ever had those opportunities there. This country, to be born here, to grow up here, I am so blessed. Like this, there is nothing, and I don't, there are beautiful countries in the world, but there is nothing like the United States. Like I really, I, it just, you can be, you can be no one, have no money, no nothing, and come here and work, and bust your butt, and you can be something. There's other places in the world you cannot do that. Agreed. Yeah, and it's tough to explain that to people if they don't go and take the time to, or have the opportunity to go see those things. Good opportunity or bad, however you look at it. How long have we been talking for? It feels like a really long time. One hour and 37 minutes. We're not done. We're I want to know about the pre, uh, presidential protective detail. I got questions. Okay, okay. Will your listeners stay on this long? I don't know. It's up to them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. I don't know. I mean, it depends on uh, whether or not they connect with what we're talking about. True. I, I, th- I mean, I don't know how many people get to talk with Secret Service agents. Former. Former, right? Former, whatever, retired. But doesn't, they get, doesn't that bother you too sometimes? That it's like, yes, it's what I did a while back. Sure. Yeah. It's like, it's not who I am. But it's a part of who you will always be, whether you like it or not. People yes. will associate that title with you for the rest of your life. And I struggle with that one too, because I definitely don't want to be keyholed into just being that person. I have no problem with it springboarding me into whatever might be next, but I just I don't want that acronym to follow me because it's not as cool as Secret Service. <laughs> we just have a cooler name. <laughs> Hands, kudos to whoever came up with that name. <sighs> like, I got it. It's going to be a public organization called The Secret Service. It's true, it's true. Just when you say to people, like, wow. But then five <laughs> minutes later, they're like, oh, FBI, right? Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. oh, she's CIA. So you put in, post 9-11 now, we're years past 9-11. Yes, so you back. put in for the presidential detail. Yes, I put in, I throw my name in the hat. I have to go through a, another physical training exam in my office, which is New York. I pass that, they test me, and then they send me to Washington, D.C. When you go to Washington, D.C., now you have to go through like a, I don't know what it's called. It's just, it's, it's not another academy, but it's just another selection process, like what we discussed. Yeah. Probably just additional training and refinement. Exactly. With standards that you have to meet, I'm assuming. You have to meet those standards because there are people that do not meet them. And if you do not meet them, then you cannot go to the president's detail. Think of the president's detail like that's the peak. And it's just... And when you say that, 
Does that mean you're working in the White House? Does that mean you're working directly with and around the president? I mean, is or how broad is that term when people say the president's detail? So the, the term PPD, mm-hmm. which is Presidential Protective Division, hopefully I said that correctly. Yeah. Um, I have no idea. But, but I'm going to go you, with you on it. You know what it's like when you learn acronyms and you just stop saying the full word? Yeah. Word, and so we might, I might butcher it, but PPD, when you go to PPD, that means you live, eat, and breathe the president, president's detail. So you, everything I did before is gone. And now you are 24 hours um, in service of the president. So, so you're I, straight protective. The investigations have fallen to the side. It's all gone. Okay. So now I move, I, phys, I physically move to Washington, D.C. I go through the training. I pass. I go through a process where I'm helping in another division for a little bit. And then actually before I went to the president's detail, I ended up having Barbara Pierce Bush, which is the daughter of G- President George Bush, one mm-hmm. of the twins. They actually gave me her for a while. I was her assistant detail leader, which means I was in charge of her protection for a bit. I had supervisors above me, but I had that assignment, which was awesome, by the way. It was, it was different because she was young, and we were not too many years apart. And so she just was a much more interesting person to be around and do protection with, and she was just a great protectee. But then after that, I ended up going to shifting into PPD. First, I started doing the perimeter security around the White House, whereas a lot of people don't know, but people come, they monitor, they leave stuff behind, they want to see how law enforcement is going to react, whether it's something real or a package that's just left to just arise suspicion. So, How often does that happen? It happens often. That's what I figured. I was, it happens I wouldn't often. have been surprised if you said every day. It might be every day. It happens, I think. Some people may forget something. I do think there's a group of people who leave stuff and then go back and watch to see how we respond. Yep. Which is smart. They want to see what do we do, what do we shut down, who responds, how long does it take, what mechanisms do we, you know, what do you Trying to understand your playbook. Yes, exactly. That legit, I know, does happen. Happen. And so I started off in that division, and then I went to the first lady. So I was with Mrs. Obama, and at that point, there's two functions. There's, and I can can talk about this because I, the service okayed it in my book, so it's okay for me to talk about it here. So we have two, two sections. It's called the shift. And it's called the advance. The shift is what you see that's with the protectee. So when you see the president come off the plane, mm-hmm. the agents with him, they're called the shift. And literally you're in, I don't want to use this term, it's not the, uh, the appropriate term, but you're in the bodyguard mode if you, to say yeah. you're with him and you're there to shield, protect, and we move and there's a choreography to the way we move. Like everything is perfectly designed for a specific function. That's the shift. Then there's the advance and that's the portion of the agents to actually go overseas to prepare for the arrival of someone. So, for example, when I was on the First Lady's detail, Mrs. Obama went to Africa, and I was sent to Botswana for a month. And I was there, and I worked with the State Department and the the government and the South African government working out the logistics. Guns, what do we bring? Cars, all that stuff. Hotels, logistics. It was just, it was intense. Um, And that's the advance. But when you're on the, when you're on PPD, you do both. We just swap. When you know, one week you're shift, next week you're like, hey, you're in advance, which is nice because it changes, changes mm-hmm. it up. But the thing is, like, your life is not your own. You live and eat, breathe that job. And I think there's a lot of sacrifices that people make, a lot of marriages that don't succeed, I think, a lot of spouses that come with their you're good. Leave it there. loved ones and just kind of like, I never see you. What does a day look like? Like, say you're on shift a, at a broad perspective. What, what's your wake up and go to bedtime and everything in between? So shift work sucks. Let's just put it out there. It sucked because we had, I hopefully one day they'll change it, but the way our shift worked is you had, we had day shift, afternoon shift, night shift, and then training or advance or travel. So which meant for the, all those years you're on the detail, it could be five years, you work day shift, which means 5 a.m. I'm on post, and I'm done around one or two, and I do two weeks of that. Then the next two weeks, it's afternoon shift, 1 p.m. to like 9 p.m., whatever it was, and then two weeks of 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. That's got to destroy your circadian rhythm and everything inside of your body. I had wrinkles on my face. I looked like I was 90. It was, well, it was, it was, it was five years of that. Two weeks days, two weeks afternoons, two weeks shift, two weeks travel. So you stayed on PPD for five years? I'm wondering if it was a full five. It might have been a little less than five. Okay. It was probably Sounds like a less. substantial amount of time, though. But you're doing, this, you're doing this for years. 
And shift work is brutal. So when you do shift work, you can show up at the White House if they're at the White House, if they're home. But if they're traveling, then you're traveling with them or you're leapfrogging. So I remember once I worked a midnight shift uh, at the White House, but that morning the president was going to leave to go to San Francisco. So as soon as I was done with my shift, I hopped on, I went straight to the airport. I got a red eye. And caught a red eye with my vest, all my gear. I get on the plane and I fly to San Francisco to get there before he gets there. We had maybe like a couple hours sleep. They gave us maybe three hours sleep. And then as soon as he landed, I had to be ready to receive him with my shift group at the hotel. Then he comes to the hotel and then I'm working that shift. So shift Work is supposed to be eight hours, but sometimes it can be 16 hours. There's days you're standing in front of a door or you're in the middle, middle of Wyoming and with snow and you're 12-hour shifts. I think that, the shift work and then just that was hard, just standing there. Because you're supposed to stand and look. You're not supposed to be on your phone. You're not supposed to be, you're supposed to be out there looking for somebody, the threat. Yeah. And it's, it's you have to be in this constant state of alertness. It's very hard to just be there and be quiet. It's a grind. It chips away at you like percentage point at a time. We went through uh, additional training for, what the hell did we call it? PSD, personal security detail stuff. Oh, yeah. You guys did that. So we would do that. Like we, I've done advanced work when um, you know generals would go overseas. I did some stuff in the United Kingdom, even some stuff in the U.S. And it's, I hated that job. I hated the reactive nature of it. Like, I'm here. Everybody can see me. <laughs> I can't do anything until you do something. Please don't do something. And you're just like, ha. But it just grinds away at you. Like, the same thing. Stand in front of this door for even two hours. Like, just, if people want to understand how hard it is, literally just go stand in front of a door for two hours. Don't take your phone. And be alert and try to observe all the behavior of people that you see past that door deciding whether or not they're a threat and then multiply that by five and that's your average work day and you're gonna probably want to brush your teeth with a pistol the next morning <laughs> <laughs> it's rough i hated it it's it every look the job is great but that part of it i know in the movies it looks fantastic and i think sometimes people don't realize that sometimes these... in the movie though there's a guy standing out there watching a dumpster or a garbage can <laughs> And I'm assuming that's real. I've done that. That's what I've I'm done saying. that. I've done that. I, right here. I mean, it's like agents stand here and make sure nobody comes to this door for 16 hours. Or Ugh. the HVAC system. It'll put you on a rooftop because we want to protect the air coming into the building. So somebody yep. can come and just drop something into an HVAC mm-hmm. system in the building. And now the whole building system's corrupt. So you're on top of a building in a, in a skyscraper somewhere. And you're freezing and you're standing there just to make sure nobody drops something. Yeah, there's a lot that goes into it that is invisible, for sure. A lot of people don't realize, look, most of security and most of protection, it's all the stuff you do in advance. It's everything you do in advance. And then, look, that layer, that shift layer, that's there that when it's like when things get through the, penetrate through the layers, which they shouldn't. Yeah. Because if you do your layers correctly, which it's, it's multiple layers of security, that that layer is there to be that final thing. But with presidents, one of the tricky things that exists is that they have to be connected with the public. And that's where it gets difficult. That's where shift work can get difficult because they sh- they're shaking hands. They're going to these events where there's thousands of Ride people. Ride that fine line. And people lose their minds. I mean, there was, people would hug the president and it wasn't just Obama, any president. They'd hug him and then they, they wouldn't let go. So we have this maneuver where if they hug someone, you take like the middle finger and you bend it back and yeah. so you can help them release the hug. <laughs> <laughs> so this, I'm hoping I didn't break too many fingers out there, but you'd see that death grip go on. It's like, you have to let him go. He has to keep moving. Yeah. And so there was maneuvers that would, they, they teach us to do on people's hands or arms or neck just to get them to kind of release the person so they could move on. I don't think they've ever showed somebody releasing the hug with the middle finger, which is good because the agent is probably behind the president and the camera is probably in front capturing the hug. They can't see it. Yeah. <laughs> it's hidden. <laughs> It's because I don't want to grab her or her or him from front, so you do it from behind. I'm sure. standing behind. You just bend the hand, the finger back. You just do one finger. One finger hurts more. And then they let go. They realize. I think some people just they they get caught in the moment. They get caught. They because people know. probably do lose their shit. It's like it, it's like going to concert sometimes, and it depends on the president too. Yeah. Clinton was. I remember the times when I would help out. I was never on his detail permanently, but I would help out a lot on his shift because he moved to New York after his presidency, and I would have him quite a bit. People loved him, and he liked engaging with people. 
And then it, so it was, it was difficult. And then sometimes too, with the public, you're always scanning, looking for a threat, looking for a threat. And shooting was a big part of it where you had to be, they wanted us to be very accurate shooters because if you're shooting, you're, you might be shooting into a crowd and yeah. you better be very, very, very good at shooting. And that was important. I loved, I loved shooting. I loved the art of it, the, the, the sport of it. But I also, it was very stressful because you understood that every time you're doing something like my mind would go, okay, if that person's a bad guy or the threat, can I shoot him at that distance and not hit somebody else? And that, was, that would be very a difficult thing, a kind of a nerve-wracking thing to think about sometimes. It's like you better be yeah. good. Yeah, taking into account your backdrop and all those other factors. Why did you decide to stop doing it? So it was about 13 years almost for me. And I think your situation was different, and I think you didn't want to go. And I think for me... I looked at it and I loved what I did, but I think we change, we shift as people. And when I went in, I was young and I wanted to do something else. And while I worked in the White House, I was around the White House press pool and I was one of the few agents that didn't mind working with the press pool because we had to stay with them and make sure we, they stayed in a certain area. Corralled. Corralled them. <laughs> we would call it, no offense to the press pool, but we were like, oh, who's going to babysit the press today? And one of the... Uh, NBC was there, and there was somebody from NBC who came up to me, one of the producers, said, you ever thought about going on air to cover news or to cover national security and all that? And I hadn't, and they kind of planted that seed, and I was like, no, I don't know. Thank you, but I'm not sure. And maybe a good year or two years went, behind, went you know, past, and I, it kind of stayed with me, and I remember looking around, and so look, I love the job. But one of the things I noticed is that when you do that job so much, because we, we li- we were, all we were was that job, I felt that I was worried that all I would be was that job. And I'd see guys and gals leave or retire, and they would struggle with their identity because that job became so part of who you were that I would see people leave, and they didn't realize, like, who am I now? And I remember I had a boss, great boss. He did that job for many years, and there's a point where they force you to retire and he didn't want to go. And they forced him to retire. And for six months, he kept coming back to the office. Nobody said anything to him. He would just come in and do paperwork and sit at the desk. And you could just see the struggle. And I would see, and I, I say guys because it was mostly men on my job. It was, it was predominantly men in the service. I could see them struggle. And I knew that after I left, I didn't want to do security. Private security just wasn't my thing. So I kind of was like, you know, maybe this is a, an exit point. Maybe this is an opportunity to do something else. And I feel like we have one life, and maybe this goes back to my 9-11 thing, but you have one life. And I think I wanted to live as many lives within that one life as possible. And so it was terrifying. I was like, all right, let me give this a try. And so I was like, I'll do news. I'll cover national security, and I'll start doing that. And initially, my first move was to go to NBC to do that kind of like as a security analyst. Mind you, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. The same way I went with the blinders on into the police academy, I went into this new profession. And I just shifted and I said, you know, it's time for me to go. And it was weird, it was a struggle because I knew I was supposed to go, but I I didn't wanna go. And I actually, I gave my two weeks to my boss and I told no one else. And I told him, I was like, please don't tell any of the other agents. Because I didn't have the heart, I knew if other my colleagues came, they're like, dude, you're leaving? Where are you going? What are you going to do? Mm. I knew I would break. And I knew I wouldn't be able to do it. And so I said, so I, my boss just knew and the higher ups. And then I left. And I said nothing to no one. Because I would have changed my mind. And then I ended up going into this other career field that I had to figure out and navigate. And I think we just grow, Andy. We change as people. I just didn't want to sure. be that one thing. And I yeah. had seen guys that were just like, this is what I am. And I was afraid. I was like, it's what you are right now. There's an ex- expiration on everything from cottage cheese to careers. And, uh, you know, a guy serves in the military. Say you can do 30 years, which is an absurd amount of time. But if you join and you're 18, you're not even 50 yet. You better have a plan B. Or your plan B is going to be at the VFW telling stories that people are getting tired of hearing. Yeah, you get stuck. I mean, do you see? I do. I, would- I do see people struggle with it for sure. And I think the point you made is correct. It, the people I see struggle the most are the ones who have so much of their identity associated with that one thing. It becomes who they are, not what they do. Yes. It's a dangerous place to be. Yes. Uh, where'd you meet your husband? 
<laughs> so he was in the Secret Service as well, and he scandalous, was scandalous, <laughs> Evie. Scandalous. We're allowed. We're allowed. <laughs> Actually, to be fair, did I? I dated him because he ended up leaving the service okay. and he went to Homeland Security. So I did not begin dating him until after he left. But in that organization, there were many agents who actually were married. Cool. Um, they didn't frown upon it at all. In fact, I think at least for me as a woman, having a husband who understood that world was very helpful. I was just going to say that you guys had a shared understanding of the demands of the job. It is very hard. And you know what? I take that back. Not just a woman. I would see the guys that I worked with struggle so much at home with their wives and their families and divorces because they could not understand the lifestyle. It was such a hard lifestyle. And I think a lot of families or wives felt like you're choosing this job over us. And they didn't understand, like, you can't, when you get an assignment, you can't say, hey, uh, hey boss, can you, I, can we just, can we change this? Or I want to do dinner. I remember even before I got married, I wanted to go on a date. I had to book, I had to three weeks out, go to my boss. I need this day off. Cause so I can make sure I had off so I can go on a date with someone else. Someone, it was a very, there was no such thing as sick leave. We, sick leave was something you scheduled. <laughs> <laughs> I will be having the flu from December 20th to January 2nd. No, you showed up to work. <laughs> you showed up to work. You were the, you, the only way you don't show up is either if you're in the hospital or on your way to the hospital or dead. You show up to work. You never, there's no such thing as calling in sick because everybody has a function. And if one player doesn't show up, the whole thing gets jammed. Yeah. So you, you schedule sick leave. But Going back to my husband, he was an agent, and I went and got my master's in forensic psychology. And this actually, kudos to the service, they sent me to get it uh, at the time when I was um, learning to do interviews and stuff. And so I had met him through that. He was an interrogator, but he was in the Midwest in a flyover state somewhere else. And so I'd see him once in a while. Our paths would cross. But I knew him for years, and I didn't actually date him until many years later, until actually I was in the president's detail towards the end of my career. And so he was a polygraph examiner as well. So he had the same interrogation skills. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Thanksgiving dinner must be amazing. Sitting there just interrogating each other across like, oh, I noticed you looked up and to the left. Yeah, when you <laughs> answered that question. <laughs> no, that's awesome. It, I think probably there's a lot of strength to be gained from you two having the same background and understanding of those demands. Because if you've never lived that, I think it gets really, really difficult. I think it would have been hard yeah. for me to, I don't I think it would have been hard for that person. I also think they might not have accepted me because look, when you're, and it's not one of the, it's when you're a guy and you do this kind of job, people like people, women look at it, they're like, yeah, wow, look at that. That's cool. And you're a girl. They kind of look at you like, what's wrong with you? Why would you want to do that? I could see that. And I would have that people say that to me quite a bit. You know, why are you even internally? Like, why are you here? Hmm. Yeah. So it's a, it's an interesting thing to kind of go through, but best, best thing I ever did in my life. Is it what drove you deciding to write a book? I know it's not coming out until what? April? April. April. But guess who has one? <laughs> you do. It's but right here. It had to go through a pre-publication review process with the service that took quite a while. Why'd you decide to write a book? So I almost did not. I had been approached to write a book before, but everybody wanted, oh, tell us what, what it was like in there. Tell us yeah. about... And so essentially they wanted to tell all, and I said no. So this one is about, I wanted to write a book that would help people. So I didn't want to write a book about myself because I just, it's just not who I am. I didn't be like, oh, let me tell you what I did and who I was. It just, it was, that's a very difficult for me, thing for me to do. But I wrote a book where there's a narrative, there's some stories about me that I share to help write the book, to make it interesting for the reader, but it's, I took essentially all the things that I was taught to, as far as protection, as far as um, resilience, training, all the things that I learned that helped me deal with the world that we live in, to, to be a more stronger person, to be a more resilient person. And I called the book Becoming Bulletproof because, in a sense, like we, we, we all want to be that resilient human being. And my, like every day we wear our bulletproof vests all the time because of obviously the nature of our work. And what a lot of people don't realize Kevlar, which is what the bulletproof mess is, uh, vest is made out of, is, is fabric. Mm -hmm. and most layered people, and layered and layered. Right. And so I thought of the, making the book in this way. Initially, everyone's like, oh, you should call it fearless. And I really had an issue with that. I'm like, no, because there's no such thing 
And people, or people would meet me and say, oh, you must, be, you must not be afraid of anything. And it's just not true. And so I think when you tell people, oh, you, sh- you should be fearless, and when you feel fear, you think, oh, something's wrong with me. Nothing's wrong with you. It's one of the most natural emotions that there is. You're supposed to. It's- yeah, so it helps with evolution, too. Like, I'm afraid of a lion on the Serengeti. Maybe don't go run with them. <laughs> you know, the person who's not afraid of lions on the Serengeti is now dead. Their, you know, their DNA did not pass on. <laughs> It's true. Or even in a life thing, like when I left the service, I was afraid. I knew I had to do it, but I still was afraid. I still did it anyway. And so with the book, so I took all these different strategies and everything I learned as far as interviewing people, influencing people, strategies, how to, to use them in your everyday life so that you can, so it can help you. So I, we split the book in three sections. The first part is protection. So it's the physical part where people are always curious, like, hey, how do I protect myself, my family, my kids? There's that element of it. And then there's also the mental protection because I think it's not just physically protecting yourself, but sometimes we have to be able to mentally protect ourselves from situations and people. I think the mental aspect will lead you out of the physical requirement like high 90th percentile of the time. One of the, I was flipping through the book. It just showed up yesterday. I definitely am going to read this, but I was flipping through it and looking at it and I like the layered approach to it and a lot of the stuff that you had in there about reading body language, the warning signs. If you can recognize warning signs early, you don't have to get into a physical altercation. If you can distance yourself, and almost, almost every physical altercation is avoidable, in my experience. Most people choose to enter into them because they want to either prove themselves or the bravado or they're hammered or they just, you know, they're making bad decisions. But I look at almost every violent confrontation I've ever been in outside of my old job. Yeah, that... I could have avoided every single one of them, but you can't if you're not paying attention. And that's one of the big things I think the book will help people with is give them some tools to recognize warning signs early and then act on the warning sign. That's one thing I try to tell people, like just act on the warning sign. You don't have to wait for the catastrophe. Maybe leave before the catastrophe occurs and you, and then you find yourself embroiled it and you can't get out of it. Remove yourself from the situation. We, but you can't do unless you're paying attention. Yes, and I think, some, I think people think that when you walk away, it's a cowardly thing to do. That's the smart Correct. thing to do. Because if you sit and you engage with every buffoon that comes your way... Yeah, you're a moron. And you'll never get anything accomplished. Because <laughs> 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 there's plenty of them out there. It is, yes. So, and it's, so it was incorporating reading people, but then also sem- assessing people because we have a lot of deceptive people that come into our lives. Obviously, sometimes what somebody says is not in harmony with what they mean. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of that polygraph training and my experience on my own in interviewing people and through a lot of the research that I've done through science, there's techniques and things that you can do that you can look out for, but you have to pay attention to people. So it's like noticing the things people say. So, I, you know, there's the, the verbal part. Like there's certain things that people say that when you hear it, it's like a little red flag should go up to help you to inquire, okay, why did this person answer this question this way? I asked them this, you know, what time did you come home last night? Oh, I usually come home around six. It's not what I asked you. I asked you what time did you come home last night? But sometimes we'll hear that and we'll move on to the next question. Yep. And we don't realize that there's more things we should follow up on. And it's the nuances also of influencing people to talk to you. We don't get anywhere. I'll tell you this. I never got a confession from anybody when I told them that they were going to go to jail, when I told them that they were a horrible person, when I was like, I'm going to... Bad cop? No, 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 it doesn't work. It's do- it does not work. But there's other strategies you can use, like priming people. So priming is, for example, starting off a conversation in a way. Like every line I use when I enter an interview, and even today when I do a business negotiation or a deal, my first line is always rehearsed. I know what I'm going to say. And then you prime a sentence. For example, Andy, it's so great to meet you. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm open to having this relationship and sharing all this information. And I look forward to the opportunity of, of working together and cooperating and having an honest relationship. So that sentence, even though it's, it didn't flow as well, but in that sentence, I primed you with words. Sharing, cooperative, together, open, relationship. You can prime people. That shit doesn't work on me. It does work on you. It doesn't. It totally works. I'd be like, works. what is this? this you won't know. Suspect. That's the thing. You don't know when it happens. <laughs> <laughs> Look, this whole interview we were talking, <laughs> and you don't realize it, but when you were doing this, I was doing this. I was watching that. <laughs> Stuff doesn't work on me. I sell everything. <laughs> But it can work and it can really help people in just, it's not a tactical way. It's just in every yep. day, in your everyday life. And I think for me, 
that was the goal of this book. Like, let me give you all the tools that I've learned over the years that have helped me and they can help you be more resilient and not be fearless, but live fearlessly. People who tell me they have no fear, I get uh, extremely concerned with because it tells me that probably one of two things is happening. They're either not paying attention or they're a sociopath. It's bullshit. Yeah. Well, both of those things are dangerous. Uh, I've, yeah. Fear is, like I was saying, it's a, probably one of the most natural emotions you could ever have as a human being. And it, it's an alarm bell. Like, hey, maybe you should pay attention to this. Maybe this is dangerous. Maybe you shouldn't do this. But you have to find a way to not be paralyzed by it. It's about making smart decisions. Like, I run, I run at night. And I go to a park by my house and I go running there. And there are nights when I go, if it's dead quiet, I leave. I'm yep. like, you know, this doesn't feel right tonight. I don't, I don't like, I'm not like, oh, I'm going to go run. I'm so-and-so. It's like, no, this is a... Yeah, this you're paying attention a, to your environment. A bad situation. And I think it's also about... The other thing with the book I talk about is about... I think we live in a world where everyone's like, oh, it should be stress-free and this and that. And I really have a different school of thought that stress is good. Stress is actually what makes you more resilient. And it's... Um, there's a term for it. It's called the hermetic effect. And they use it in our training academies and where they, in, they put small amounts of stress on you over periods of time mm-hmm. and they increase that stress and that actually makes you more resilient. Buds is the same way. If you look back at the last day of Buds versus the first day of Buds, you're able to tolerate stress or even in any training pipeline I've been able to go through. Breaking people with stress is super easy. You just overload them the first day and they can't handle it because they're not resilient or they haven't become inoculated to that level of stress but you layer it an ounce at a time. And a few months later, they can handle an immense amount of stress, amount that would break them on the first day. But you have to apply it properly in those protocols or you just snap people. Where, where, in, in training in BUDS, where would people fall out or break them the most? It was usually physically based. It was, a, it was um, I, you know, I say, they, people say that BUDS is all mental and there's a huge mental component to it but you're, you're still driving around in your human body, right? You're still navigating in a flesh machine. And there's a lot of requirements on the body and it becomes painful or you're tired or you're cold or you're hungry or the combination of all those things. And then it starts eating away at your brain. Like, I can't do this anymore. I can't do this for the next six months. Uh, so it was more in those moments of, we would introduce stress via physical activities and requirements and standards and just watch people come unwound between the ears. But it was in the beginning of training, uh, probably the first five or six weeks of training is the highest level of attrition because everything is overloaded. There are some situations that are very difficult to pass, if, if not impossible to pass, because you have to learn how to deal with failure too um, and just really stress the students out and look at them at the, you know, the most microscopic level that we could and to try to basically drive them to the lowest point and then see the behavior that comes out because that's the true person. Yeah, because you don't think you you don't have time to think. Yeah, you're too you're just fried. I mean, Hell Week is a good example where they keep us up basically for five days straight, and most of the attrition and training occurs in the first two days of that, and then people just become overwhelmed. I've always been fascinated with Bud's training. It is not very fascinating. <laughs> it is actually, you know, we use the ocean, the sand, some telephone poles, some boats. Lessons on teamwork, leadership, and just try to suppress human beings to their lowest levels and see whether or not they can still put their own desires aside and function as a team, whether they're going to be selfish. I mean, it's, you get people to that level where they're so fried, and you'll watch them make selfish decisions instead of ones that benefit the team. You'll watch them shut down. They won't communicate. They won't give a shit about anybody other than themselves. And it's like, hey, your, this job is not for you. Can you, can you disqualify someone when they behave that way or do they have to actually do something? They have to quit, but most of the time that behavior will, will lead to it along the way. You can, and a, the class will turn on those people as well. Like you'll have this boat cruise of six or seven people and you'll just see the one person become ostracized because in those moments where they have a chance to be selfish, they'll take it and everybody else on their team sees it and they're like, oh, okay, motherfucker. And they chip away at that person and then they'll eventually quit. Till they leave. Yep. Andy, I'm curious, with, with women, there haven't been SEALs that were women. Have it has had- only been open to women applicants, I believe now for the first five or six years. There have been two women, and I'm uh, paraphrasing this, and I've heard this third hand. When you go to the Naval Academy, you have the opportunity, they do stuff in the summers, 
and there's a, I think it's called mini buds. It's for the officers who are looking to go down the seal pipeline. It is an incredibly condensed version. And from my understanding, two women have applied for and gone to the mini buds program. Both of them DOR'd or drop on request, which is a polite way to say quit. Quit. Yeah. What do you think it is? What part of the process do you think is the, I think it's going to be the physical element. Uh, it's physiological. The, the differences between the male, I do believe it's possible that there's a woman who could graduate from the training program. And if they did, awesome. I have no issues with serving with a female seal. It wouldn't bother me at all, as long as the standards were never moved. But there are vast physiological differences between the female body and the male body. And there's a ton of strength required, specifically upper, upper body strength in buds. And it would, like I said, the woman's out there. Whether or not that woman wants to be a SEAL, I don't know. And it, it will probably take a while to find that person. It is correct, like what you're saying. And I'm saying this, being a woman, like there is, we are not physically created equally. Like for me to do pull-ups, like it took work. Yeah. My upper body strength is different, designed differently than... The men's. In fact, you know, full disclosure, when I went to the service my first week, I went there and I went through from the New York City Police Academy. And I remember sitting in the the lunch hall. It was the first week and I was sitting with some of the other New Yorkers. I'm eating and they were acting kind of weird around me. And I, one of the guys like, tell her. And I was like, tell me what? And they were kind of quiet. And I was like, tell me what? And then one of the guys who was actually a friend, he's like, look, he's like, we don't want to upset you, but some of the other people here don't think you should be here. And I was just like, okay, you know, why? And, you know, my mind, I'm like, did I not say hello to somebody in the hallway when I walked by them? <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell, like, I'm complete fish out of water sometimes? That's where my mind went, you know, because I'm, I'm New York, so I'm like, I was probably maybe rude to someone, and I didn't realize it. And he was like, no, he's like, they just feel that you shouldn't be here. And it was just the first week, and I was like, well, how can you make that assessment of me. I passed everything you guys passed. And then one of the guys was like, well, he's like, the physical requirements are not the same. And he was right. And I went and I found out. The men's and that's requirements- that's a super dangerous protocol. And the f- the, it, this is all law enforcement, by the way. Yeah. The men's requirements, the standards are different from the women. And so I went and I went to the PT instructor and I said, could you give me the sheet that shows the men's and the women's? And he's like, sure. And he gave it to me. And at that point, I was like, I will train to meet the men's requirements. Because yeah. there's different levels. There's excellent, there's... Well, there should be good, no men or women's requirement. Because the, in the environment you're going to operate in, out in the real world or the street, it, there is no requirement. You're not going to encounter somebody who says, oh, you're a woman, so I'm going to react. I'm going to give you 80%. It's, you're going to get what you're going to get. Exactly. And so I was, I was like, you know what? I don't want to hear shit from anybody. I got that. I pinned it on the wall in my room. And I was like, I will train to meet all these requirements. And so, and that's what I did. And so even like with pull-ups, truth be told, I'd never had to do a pull-up, even in the NYPD. So I went to the service. I, I couldn't do any pull-ups. I had never done them before. And I was just like, I'm going to do them. And I'm not going to do them at the, the women's standard. I'm going to do them at the men's, stand, men's standards. And I just did pull every day to like, I couldn't feel my arms, pull-ups, pull-ups, pull-ups. And you just do it because it's like, I don't, want, I don't want anyone to think I didn't earn it. Mm-hmm. But it's interesting because even then, most people will be like, you know what? Yes, I'll work with you. I'll take a door with you. I'll do whatever with you. But then there's always still going to be people that no matter what you do, because I remember when we did the final phase of training and we, they did like one of the things they tested up, like for example, pull-ups were saying, I went up there and I banged out, I might've banged out more pull-ups than half the class half of my class. I beat a lot of the guys. Not one of those guys that had an issue with me came up and said, hey, good job, Pomparis. So sometimes some people will still have an issue. Yeah. But that's when you realize, like, that's, that's when that. you know that's on you. Yeah, fuck those people. But That's I, my personal theory. Perhaps it wouldn't be the best, but that's my personal theory. But I do agree with you. Like, there is standards that are different, and there are times when even me as a woman, I would see someone else go through, and I'm like, I don't think that's right. Because in the street, no one's going to care. Yeah, you get what you get. I'm going to let you close it out. What would you like to close with? What would I like to close with? I don't know, Andy. Pretty you don't have to know. You know. I'm interrogating you. That's not how you interrogate. 
It's how I interrogate. Have you, have you, let's, this, I know how we're going to close it. Have you ever interrogated anybody? Yes, but um, none of the procedures that I use <laughs> should be replicated. <laughs> <laughs> I think we went to very different interrogation schools. Yes, I didn't go to a school. I just needed information. Well. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. Well, this was awesome. Yeah, thank you for making the flight. Thank you from... New York to Montana. From New York City to Montana, definitely. Yeah. It's actually very nice out here. I I see what it's all about. It doesn't suck. And when the book comes out, I'll make sure to put up uh, another post about, the, a post about the book because it's awesome. And I think people need the tools. That's one thing I think is missing is a good set of tools for people that can apply. And I just, if I could change, I mean, there's a lot of things that I would change, but one thing I would certainly change about most people is just pay more attention. Most people, vast majority of people, probably high 99.9% of people I think they have good heart. I think they have good morals. But that doesn't mean that there are people who won't prey on that. And you're never going to find them unless you pay attention. I think also, but even as good people, like even good people make bad decisions. Even good people sure. hurt people. Even if you look back in your life and I look back at my life and there's decisions we've made where it's like, you know what? I hurt this person. I did wrong to this person because that's just what we do. And I think with the book, like the idea with the book, it really just stayed in harmony with who I am. It's just to serve and I was like, how can I serve? I don't want to just write a book to write a book. I don't want my name to be on the cover. I didn't care. Genuinely, I didn't care. Yep. And even with this, they're like, oh, let's put your photo on it. I'm like, no, no. It's going to be. <laughs> I don't want my photo anywhere. It can be in the back in a little small block, you know, where they put the author's photo. But that's not the point. It's just to be of service to people. It's like, look, I was privileged. Both you and I were very privileged to go through something, to be around very, like, we were around some of the best people. Totally agree. And the reason why I try to make brave decisions and I feel like I have courage in me is because I was around other people who were strong and had courage and pushed me. You know, one of the questions, sometimes people say, would you really take a bullet for someone or for the president? And I'd say, yeah. Well, first of all, they're like, oh, for that person or whoever person they were, you know, pointing out to. It's like, first of all, you don't, I never served the president. You don't serve the person. You, you serve the office of the president. And what you're doing is bigger. It's a symbolic thing. And for me, my mindset was is like, you know what? We're all going to die. All of us. But to give your life and service to save another human being's life, for me, no better way to die. That's a good ending. <laughs> <laughs>